Welcome everyone to another episode of the Main Deck Podcast. I'm your host Dan and this is the podcast for and by trading card game fans and this is our second episode actually of our uh, holiday extravaganza where we're taking a look at eight different TCGs, eight different podcast episodes all month long. So if you are just catching us now, you can go ahead and listen to the previous one with myself and Mike Piper uh, talking about Digimon card game. Today's episode, I am joined by my friend and My Hero Academia extraordinaire, Mitch Janowick. How's it going, Dan? I, I'm doing great, Mitch. How are you doing today? Uh, Thank I'm you so much for joining fantastic. today. Fantastic. Yeah, thanks for having me here. Awesome. Yeah, of course. Of course. Um, today, of course, as you guys saw, if you clicked on this anywhere, I don't know, maybe, maybe you like closed your eyes and clicked on it so you have no idea what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> this Today, we're talking about My Hero Academia in 2022 specifically. So again, this is our look back series. Um, what was 2022 like for the My Hero Academia slash universes slash UFS card game, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I, I grabbed uh, Mitch here, who's, he's kind of a, he's like sort of a guest. I'm putting him in, noting that he's a guest in like the titles and stuff, but really Mitch has been actually, uh, he's been in some content already before, and he's been working on getting some more content out for you guys too. So, um, Mitch is sort of like a, a fledgling main deck regular at this point. Trying to sprout my wings and fly. That's right. That's right. And I'm trying to open my mouth and spit worms into your mouth or something, <laughs> something yeah, like that. Oh, that, that. sounds delicious. Sign me up. I, I need some more worms in my life. Maybe I'm taking the analogy a little too far. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's never too far, Dan. <laughs> um, so, okay. So, Mitch, well, first of all, welcome to the podcast. This is your first episode with us here today. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure excited. the guests are... Yeah, I'm sure the guests are very excited to hear a different voice, some different thoughts on things. And as you know, what we usually do in this podcast here is we start off with a little bit of banter about uh, our favorite things, which are cardboard rectangles. So I do love I, me some good cardboard rectangles. Who doesn't, honestly, especially shiny ones. Oh, um, shiny the better. I thought we'd talk right away. The first thing we should do, Mitch, is let's let's have the listeners get to know you. What what is Mitch about? What makes Mitch tick? And I don't care about anything except card games right now. So go for it. <laughs> oh, perfect. Um, so I've been playing card games for most of my life. Um, I got into Magic when I was like 11, 11 roughly. Before that, I was a little bit Yu Gi Oh and Pokemon, but most of the kids are doing that. So yeah, but my uncle got me into Magic back when they were doing the Junior Super Series. Way back in the day. And the uh, the first deck he taught me after, before we're going to there was we were playing Solidarity in Legacy. Oh, my God. That Okay, hang on, hang on. This explains so much to me about you right now. So <laughs> your introduction to Magic the Gathering was playing Solidarity Legacy in Junior Super Series? Well, I had... A little bit of knowledge for them. It's like me and my dad had bought like the uh, the seventh edition like starter deck thing with Thorn Elemental. But for yeah, compared yeah, to yeah, stuff, we, yeah, that was like I think everyone things. in our generation started Magic with the Thorn Elemental. <laughs> <I feel like. laughs> yeah. It was that, and then for a little while before it got banned, it was the Flash Hulk deck. My God, yeah, yep, disgusting. Yep, Mitch, this disgusting. makes so much sense now. <laughs> so okay so for in my perspective here mitch mitch you're a local with us here there I, i'm i'm gonna say this and you're gonna think i'm trying to like i, I don't know i'm not trying to embarrass you here i, I guess is what i'm trying to say but you we'll you see. are to me <laughs> to me you are <laughs> one of the strong just like strongest competitive sensed players that i know of any card game you can sit down with a card game and you're like competitive at it within an hour um i feel like Maybe I'm overselling it. Maybe you'll you'll probably feel like I mean, I'm overselling it. I feel like you're overselling a little bit, but I'm <laughs> a little biased. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, well, I certainly this 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 context is so helpful for me to know. I had no idea what you started with because now I realize that you've always been going for blood, huh? Oh yeah, back when uh, lethal damage on the stack, then I would combo off. Those were the good old days. Disgusting stuff. Um, you said you played Pokemon too. I mean, like we all, we all, all did right back on the, oh, yeah, on the, yeah. back, like, the, on the playground and recess. Yep. Um, but the, here, here's deal. the thing. We, we all like, we all had Pokemon cards, but not everyone played it. Were you, a, were you a player or did you just have the cards? Oh, I was, a, I was a player. 
Okay. I mean, of course I assumed, but I kind of wanted to confirm. I was also the one who was like trying to be like, no guys, let's like, don't just look at it. Let's play the game. (laughs) Come on. It's fun to play. Let's play with it. Yeah, I was like, I was getting oh. starter decks, and I was like, I had Scry Magazine, and Scry Magazine was telling me, like, here's what you oh, got to do. Scry Magazine. You got to play Scythers. You got to play Hitmonchans. You got to play Double Colorless Energy. You got to do all that stuff. And and I learned all the... Tr- well, actually, I learned what the good decks were, but I didn't have the cards to build them. So I was like, <laughs> that's what I'd play if I, I mean, had that's those. Fair. Back then, getting cards was <laughs> kind of a problem for us, huh? Yeah, yeah. You know, you had like, if you're lucky, you had an allowance or whatever. Um, and otherwise you just kind of relied on whatever scraps people like, <laughs> like tossed your way. Whatever you can find out in the playground. It's like, Ooh, yeah. we, like, here, we would make these for that Hitmochan over there. Here you go. Here's this Kangaskhan here. Yeah. See, exactly. I was about to say, well, we, we would make these awful deals with each other. Like, <laughs> like I legitimately look, I'm, I hope you can agree that I'm not generally like a dick <laughs> about, oh, no, about no, things, right? but I'm pretty sure back on the playground, everyone was just like, yeah, we got to scam each other out of things. It's the oh, only way. 100%. Back when you were kids. <laughs> oh yeah. It was like, if you got the handshake and the cards, like we're done. I'm out. Yep. Got my cool cards. It's a pleasure. <laughs> And he traded. I tr- he traded me a Charizard for a Clefairy doll or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Look at me now. Yeah, that's um, that was an interesting time, but uh, you know, it makes sense. It makes sense that you were also um, a player of the game back then too. So, what? Um, Where did you go from after Magic, or did you just play like Magic for a really long time, or did you dabble in other stuff? I was in Magic for a really long time, all the way up until. Um... I guess there's like a small bit like the WoW TCG and... Ooh, that's kind of spicy. Yeah, it wasn't very great. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, it, it wasn't great or you weren't very great? It it wasn't great. Or When I played it, I was not a fan of how it played. So we dropped that pretty fast. We got into it because I was playing a lot of WoW at the time. So I was like, Well, oh, right, and cool. then the loot cards. Yeah, I was like, oh, it was great. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. They yeah, and, and it... It didn't, uh, it lasted for a while, right? They had like some raid decks come out and stuff, but then eventually. Yeah, I think I played up until the first raid deck came out and I was like, ah, oh, this sure. is just, uh, it's back to magic, back to magic. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and that, that tends to be the life of a, of a, you know, someone who gets into TCGs with magic pretty early. It's usually like magic, magic, magic. Yeah. I'll try this for a little bit. Okay, back to Magic, you know, that, that yeah, tends to happen Back a lot. then, a lot of the other card games just weren't very well designed or well made. No, I, actually, that's an interesting, that's an interesting point. There, there were, okay, so like there were a number that were pretty good, but there were just so many. That so were many, they're like, oh, just look at this garbage. Magic card game over here. Let's get on this card game hype. Yeah, um, and that's, that's certainly true I, I i feel like i tended to pick pretty well but there were like you could again you could open up that scry magazine and you could find a host of games that um, most people have never heard of because they lasted one two sets or whatever and then they were canned they, they were, were bad yeah okay, i wonder yeah. i wonder how people will look on the current age of card games when we get um you know 10 years down the line or whatever because i think there's some it's, similarities uh, right now this current age of card games, like it feels like the card games are a lot better designed in terms okay. of like just like a, an overall like player base going out. They're, the the games seem more designed with the players in mind. More you think like there's um? Do you think there's some like standing on shoulders of giants happening? Maybe these companies oh, are actually like hundred percent. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sure. Like yeah, yeah. A lot of the games like um like this new one I'm playing, uh, Marvel Snap, recently came out. Um, the lead designer Ooh. of the game was one of the original designers of Hearthstone back in the day, Ben Brode. Right. So a lot of the, um, again, like also like Magic, they had a lot of like old pro players they took onto the design team back in the day. So like it seems like a lot of the card games now are, the companies are learning that if we take players from card games to help design card games, they will turn out roughly better. Obviously there's I think... still some hit and miss there, but. Yeah, I think you're making a really, really interesting point about this because, you know, back then, who was designing games? It was like, well, it can't it can't have been pro players of games because no. there weren't <laughs> things for them to be pros at. I mean, like at other games, maybe, you know, maybe like chess grandmaster can design something or like you had, you know, there have been um, hobby board games were actually they're also pretty fresh at the time too. Um, stuff like Catan didn't come out until 90, 
oh what was that 95 maybe and like that was for largely the like the initial surge of of you know t- oh. tabletop nerd board gaming at that point We'd so like, like to call that one the gateway board game yes absolutely <laughs> Uh, if people haven't played Catan, by the way, like, honestly, I, it gets some flack in the hobby board game community because everyone's just kind of like, oh, I'm like so over Catan or whatever. But like, if you if you don't play board games and you haven't played Catan, give it a shot. It's so fun. Yeah, it's, it really is. It's just so good. So fun. It's so simple and so, so enjoyable. But um, yeah, like back then, I guess like all you really had was like D&D nerds like, you know, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Rosewater, no, sorry, not Rosewater. Jeez, what is wrong with me? Garfield. Garfield, Garfield. Yeah, my brain is all mixed up. Sorry. But I mean, I, for all I know, Rosewater is a DD nerd too. I'm not sure. But, uh, I'm yeah. not sure. I mean, Mr. Garfield himself just uh, just looking to design a game he can play in between sessions of DD and comes out with Magic the Gathering. So, um, yeah, it's it's yeah, interesting. Though. You're totally later, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah 30, 30 years. Oh man! By the way, Magic Podcast, Magic Twenty Twenty Two Look Podcast is coming. Uh, should be next week if my release schedule is on track here. So if you're listening to this right when it releases, you can stay tuned for the Magic one next week. Well, we have a lot to talk about. There. Oh, I can only imagine. Oh, That'll be a fun one. Um, years. But but yeah, I think I think that's an astute observation though that like these days with. Um, all of these card games have come out. You got like Hearthstone pros who are able to design for this game. You got Magic pros who are going, some of them, some are designing their own games, some working at Magic now and trying to improve it. Um, and and I think it's just, it's probably very likely that just in general, if we had a way of kind of like objectively measuring how good a game's mechanics are, they're probably on average better now than they were back then. Definitely agree, yeah. Just it, the games feel more cohesive be great to put it yeah um so i think you were you were i i I know you want to talk about snap because you were starting to kind of lead that way um and i want you to talk about it but i want to finish i want to finish out your history i want people to know what you're into because i know you're currently leaving out something that i um i really got to know you a lot better during this your stint playing oh yeah uh, so after that little uh foray into wow i was back to magic for a long time yeah and then uh, some people in the area here in Fargo got me into this Dragon Ball trading card game. Dragon um, Ball Z TCG by Panini. Yeah, the remake, remake of the, of the old score one. Yep, yep. And I played that one for a while with you guys, and that was a lot of fun. Mitch, did you uh, have any uh, have any success playing that game? I uh, I had some small success. Yeah, um, I won the Fargo Regional. That was great. Got first place. Wonderful. She got me the invite to the worlds for the game, and I ended up sixth place in the world. Also, very nice, very fun. Yes, I, Mitch. I know you're such a humble guy, so you're you're not going to talk <laughs> about these things unless I prompt you to do it. And I really oh, appreciate yeah. that about you. Um, b- before we get in there, because I, I don't know what I'm going to get you on a podcast next, but so let's talk about real quick about that Fargo Regional because there was one game in particular I will literally never forget. Um, Is it the, the finals? It 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 it. it it, was it wasn't it the, the final. Uh, the Piccolo deck. Yes, it was that yeah. one. So, so here's my real quick preface to anyone who doesn't know anything about this game. So this this game um, had three ways to win the game. One was decking your opponent. You did damage to them by attacks, and that removed cards from their life. It was a life deck system. Um, if you've watched that popular Seven Deadly Sins of Card Games uh, series on YouTube, that's one they say is a bad thing. I I liked it in that game, so whatever. It felt great. <laughs> Um, then another one was the, uh, the leveling up, getting to level four and gaining anger. Some decks did that. Some didn't. You just, it was an anger mechanic that was built into the game and it would allow you to level up. So, you know, whatever, not important to the story. The third one, of course, is if you collect all seven dragon balls, you, uh, you just win the game on the spot. Boom. You're just done. You win. You wish to win. And there it is. Got the win. So, so Mitch, tell, tell the audience about that game because it was just, I was judging at the time and I was watching and just loved, I, I mean, I loved and hated it, but it was just so fun to watch. So I was playing, a, a, they had different colors or styles back then. So I was playing a red deck, which mostly revolves around anger, mm-hmm. a little bit about around um, Dragon Balls. I was playing against the Namekian deck. It was most of their entire thing is Dragon Balls, a little bit of anger thing. Um, they have a thing where if they control only one Dragon Ball, you just you, you can't take it. It's theirs. You just can't have it. Yep. So when I was going into the game, I was like, shit, um, I'm almost shut out of one entire win con unless I find one specific card to answer it. But I just so happened to 
two turns in a row, draw into three Dragon Balls, three Dragon Balls on Dragon Radar, which finds a Dragon Ball, and they go, oh, I guess I win the game. <laughs> <laughs> that was like right at the beginning of the game, too. Yeah, right? it didn't even last like five minutes. Yeah, it's like okay, okay. So, um, so your opponent. I'm sorry. I feel so bad because his his name. He was the like the nicest dude in the world. I chatted God, with him was, a whole bunch. He was of a wonderful words. guy. Yeah, he was such a cool guy. Um, and, and God, if I ever, if I remember the name, I'm like, put in the description of this video here, because I feel really bad that I'm on the spot right now. I mean, I screwed up Garfield's name earlier. So, you know, my, my brain is not working today, yeah, that was too. but, um, but he was, he was, he was a brilliant guy. I think he came down from the Kansas area or something. I think they came up to the, to our state to play there. Um, and he made it to top cut and then just in Dragon Ball Z, it was, it was, uh, best of one games. And you just best like, one. you, you just like flipped uh it's like flipping a royal flush right on the right <laughs> on yep, the flop or whatever that's, that's like, all right yeah oh, um i'm all in so bad. <laughs> and, and he just like yeah and he was he was like understandably pretty upset after i would be because... if i was him i would be super upset too because not only did i draw the red dragon balls i drew the right ones because on his turn he would draw them he'd have to banish the ones i already had in play mm-hmm so if I drew with like any different order, it would have been fine too. But just, nope. Yep. No, you just happened to draw like the, just. I mean, talk about a story about drawing the absolute nuts. Like I've, I don't know if I've ever in my life seen the nuts be as absolute as they were in that moment. I don't think I will ever get that lucky again in any card game or anything I play. No, it was crazy. So, um, but yeah, we we definitely became good friends just playing Dragon Ball Z, traveling to events, and everything. Um, and then, uh, you got into universes with us when, uh, when we were all checking it out at Gen Con in 2019. Yeah. You guys dragged me along for the, the worlds back then you hand me a Jada deck and that was fun. <laughs> That's and right. I never touched the game again until now. <laughs> yeah. And, and now, and now Mitch, you have been doing extremely well. I'm very proud of you actually. Um, and I'm going to publicly say that on the stream and try and try and get you to blush oh, a little bit or something. Thanks, but Dan. I appreciate it. You're 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 an extremely skilled player, and and you just got back from back to back nationals top 32s in person and on webcam top 32ing both times. A um, little bit a little bit of rough luck in your 30 top 32 like your first matchups in in elimination there, um, but you know it happens. I mean you you know and luck happens. It, it happens. Yeah. Sometimes <laughs> you get turned to Patokiyami. It, it happens. It just, it just does. And, uh, you know, no shade on your opponents at all or whatever, but that's just how, oh, you know, no. we, it's part of card games, right? Is that, it's what we like about them is that there's some exciting variance and randomness that, that yeah, sometimes keeps... you, just, you draw hot. Sometimes it, you are meant to win. Let's, let's talk about a game with plenty of, uh, variance and randomness, but it goes by so fast. Who cares? Me, you want to, you want to lead us in on the Marvel snap discussion? Oh, I would love to. All right, so mm -hmm. quick round on Marvel Snap. Um, it's a it's a it's a mobile game. Um, so take that grain of salt. Um, it's broken up into different like pools of collections. So usually, if you're playing against an opponent, they're gonna be in the same area pool with you. So you're not gonna fight someone with a ridiculously bigger card pool than you have. Um, so sure. the idea is you build this twelve card deck. Um, every turn, you gain extra energy or mana to play cards. So like turn one, you have one, turn two is two, turn three is three. So it's consistent mana gain. Um, and then by the end of the game, you're only going to have three cards in your deck left if you draw no extra cards. So you're going to see almost your entire deck every game. So every deck building choice you make has a substantial impact on how the game plays out. Can I just cut in really quick? Um, because, you know, I, I was watching, I haven't played it since it came out, but I was watching kind of the release up to the release of, release of Marvel Snap, and um, the thing that I thought was really interesting about that was they. So it's it, is it it's sorry it's 12, 10 cards. What, what did you say again? Twelve cards. Twelve cards. Yeah, I thought it was twelve. Okay, and suddenly I was just doubting myself. Um, so I I thought it was a really interesting point they made in the video there. They when they were I watched a kind of a trailer talking about like the game at, before it came out and they said in this is a this is a TCG where you're going to build 12 card decks and my first reaction was like that's <laughs> what what why is that a thing? Yeah, How does that work at both. all? 
Um, but you know, the, the point that they make in the video, whether or not you kind of like buy into this argument or whatever, it's the point he said was like, well, in a lot of your card games, you're just, you're putting in four of like every good card anyway. So your decks are usually like 12 cards. You just have four copies of each one and then some lands or whatever. So we got rid of the lands. And then we cut down the copies to just one of each. Yeah, um, I mean, great argument. And, and I mean, I guess, yeah, like, um, uh, it, and it seems to work. You, I, from what I understand, you're having a blast with it. I have been enjoying that immensely. Yes. It's a, it's a, um, the thing that I thought was interesting about snap was that it was using a, it, it had a built in system of sort of raising the stakes when you either, because you feel like you're going to win or to like bluff your opponent out. Right. It's got the snap feature. Yeah. It's called the snap, the point of marble snap. So every time you go into a game, it starts off with a minimum bet of one cube. And cube is what you need to like rank up in the game to get to like legend or master or this one is called um, infinity rating. Sure. Um, so start off with one cube. At the end of round six, it goes to two cubes. So every match is worth two cubes if you finish it up. Um, at any point in the game, you can decide to snap. If you snap, you double it. So it goes to two and then four at the end. Your opponent can snap back and it goes from four to eight. So it doubles again and go double, double. Um, after you snap, your opponent can retreat. And if they retreat, they only lose one cube. But if they choose to stay in for that round, the snap goes through. It's like poker. They're raising your check. Yep. You want to fold, you can fold. Only lose what you want to put in the bed. I think, I think that is a... The thing that I think is really impressive about that system is how elegantly it works in a complicated betting system from poker into a into a quick and fast paced card game to the point where I bet there's a lot of people who are playing Snap and don't realize they're kind of just playing poker with with <laughs> oh, Marvel characters. Yeah. <laughs> what I Which, like about that idea is so the way you want to play Marvel Snap in order to like level up the ranks as fast as you can. Um, you can have like a 30 or 20% win rate and you can still rank up really fast. You just have to know about yeah, when to hold, when to fold. Sure. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think that's, I think that's really cool that there's, um, and by the way, b before people like get the wrong idea, um, I'm definitely not saying that the gameplay of Marvel snap is poker because it's, it's definitely not, <laughs> um, well, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean the the idea is that you're you're playing characters to zones. The zones open up as the turns pass, um, and then they have effects. And you're you're just trying to like have the most power in an individual zone to like win out at the end of the person who wins two out of three at the end of the game wins the game. Um, yeah. Basic gist of it. And so like I think you can approach Marvel Snap and play it from a like you know I'm not worry about snapping at all honestly. And you can just be like yeah I'm just gonna like play the the zone game or whatever. Yeah, and I think you, you also, can you can also just be on the next level and be like, yeah, the real game is snapping here and, <laughs> and really try and like bluff your opponent into retreating games and everything like that. Um, oh yeah. And I, I think it's, I think it's like, like a lot of the best, I'm going to bring the conversation full circle. Like a lot of the best gateway board games, um, there's sort of a, you get out what you put in factor to the game that i think is really cool if you know you get to you can decide how seriously you're going to take each element of the game and you can you know you can play you can play for snapping or you can just be like yeah i'm just trying to like combo off i've seen some obscene uh <laughs> screenshots of like some crazy like God, once you start some cool combos you do a marvel snap yeah you get there's like definitely some like exponential power things happening yeah. here. <laughs> they uh in their recent update they fixed that so it's not quite as obscene because okay. there's times where like it would lock you in an animation for like upwards of a couple of minutes so just one turn going through an animation over and over and over again <laughs> that's it's like probably good there was a combo where you'd have one guy who would double this effect you play another one who's on reveal effect is it would copy the last effect played so you would double double and then you have another one that can double it again and then you play your last card so it would trigger i think 128 times this one effect would trigger. <laughs> so it has to do 120 animations of the effect going off. That's the kind of thing though, when you hear that, if you're if you're a hobby TCG player, usually that lights your brain up a little bit. I mean you're like, Ooh. It's, it's addictive, <laughs> let me tell you. When you when you get when you draw the hot combo, it's like, oh, here it is. This is my game. And that yeah, case, the, I, I don't want to snap because I want to see the cool stuff go off. Yeah, for sure. You don't want to scare your opponent off or anything. Exactly. 
Um, yeah, it's, the only reason I haven't I haven't really played Snap, I think I, I think I talked about this in our stream the other night a little bit. The like the main reason I haven't there's two reasons. The one reason is that they haven't put out the PC version, and I I kind of wanted to stream it on PC, and I didn't want to set up like BlueStacks or whatever to do it. Ah, that's um, fair. they mentioned um, they're coming out with it soon though. They're working on it. I be, I might actually I might actually try it out. Then the other reason though is that I'm just like so loaded up on like tcgs that i'm trying to keep up with it battle passes and all this stuff where it's like ah oh, man i don't know uh, if i have yeah, time to just like start grinding a collection in another game so but i'm i'm happy to watch on the sidelines i'm having fun still just kind of like vicariously taking it in through other people you guys that I mean, are locals actually, are always like playing it on that right now on steam it's it's on steam now it's on steam right here yeah Oh well, it's outdated information. Apparently, it's on it's on PC right now. I guess I wasn't yeah, aware of that. Right now, Marvel Snap is early access on PC. Okay, well, see you, Mitch. It was a good podcast. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> all right, I'll meet you on the battle for you. <laughs> no, no, no. It's a, that's all right. That's all right. Um, yeah, yeah, cool. Marvel Snap definitely is something that people should check out if they if they haven't looked into it because it is it is free to play. I'm sure there's some microtransactions or something. But... Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like any of the uh, online card game stuff, like Arena. Right. You can be free to play, but if you spend money, you get stuff faster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So check it out if you want. If you want, pay money if you want. We're not sponsored by them or anything. I don't really care what you do, but <laughs> you know, oh. Mitch has been having fun. <laughs> I've been enjoying myself way too much. And uh, and outside of Marvel Snap, what's what's been your like paper TCG? You have you just been playing My Hero? You've been dabbling in anything else? Uh. Mostly my hero, a little bit of like commander still for magic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you you actually I talked to you about doing the the magic podcast with us, but you declined because you just haven't been playing it quite enough this year. I haven't been. Uh, I mean, I I've heard about like the big the big problems this year, and I've definitely felt a little bit of them, but I haven't been super like into the magic scene. Just been playing commander, so. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's the way with a lot of people. Commander, commander is. Um, just so easy to just like have your decks and you like, you don't have to do anything. Honestly, I, I think I like the change of now. No. And, and that's something I really like about, about commander two is that like, because of just how casual, um, what two, two reasons, one, because of how casual in nature, the, um, the format is, but also two multiplayer formats introduce i keep meaning to do a video on this because i, I really think there's some things people need to hear about this but multiplayer multiplayer formats for card games in general introduce um layers of play that don't involve what the text on your cards is um and yes for sure that that alone makes up for any shortcomings you might have in a deck as far as like power level of your cards um you're able to make up for that um not even trying to sometimes actually <laughs> um and and the in the proof i mean the real quick proof i have to give for that is that like think of any game where you are sitting in a multiplayer game and you didn't draw your best cards like even if your deck's perfect you know like didn't maybe you, you land flooded or something um in a commander game and then the three other people are just like you know pointing fingers at each other about who's the real threat and like oh we got to deal with him you can you often can sit in the corner and just like draw cards for a few turns and get your and like eventually find your way back into the game yeah, just um, because that game is like yeah they're spending all this time and resource dealing with each other you're like all right i've been out of the threat for a while so everybody's forgotten about me in the corner over here exactly um if 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 nothing else you can just think of that simple scenario it has many different forms many different extrapolations from that as well but it's that's the that's the basic idea which which ultimately and, and so like the ultimate point i'm trying to make here is that you can have a commander deck that you built like five years ago or whatever and you can sit down with people playing the hottest stuff and like literally just like beat them all like with you know it's just like it's not like you're missing anything um no. necessarily so it's a great format just to like have decks for and like yeah you know if you care if you want to update your decks at some point put, find some spicy new cards or whatever you can but you you have no need to and i actually recommend people like stop optimizing your decks in commander oh, maybe yes, that's like a hot please. take but like <laughs> You don't have to. to be, I guess it depends upon your play group, I guess. Some people want yes. to say competitive kind of stuff in there, but I'm playing commander to have fun. But I think I think a lot of people and like playing competitive commander can be fun. 
Like hundred percent. I'm not like, I'm not saying like you are, you are having fun wrong is not like no, the podcast no, no, not that, no, no, no. theme here today. Um, but the, the point I want to get across is just that, um, I, and I think if you look at, especially if you look at how they've designed some, some recent sets, like, uh, the, the commander, commander legends series so far, there are so many cards in commander legends and commander legends battle for Baldur's gate that are like, and I think like, you know, the, the people know this and they reacted to this essay way. They're like, these are like not as powerful as these other cards or whatever. Like, why is this set so underpowered or whatever? It's like, because that doesn't matter. There's a bunch of stuff in there that is like hilariously fun to play. And you, and I swear, I swear to you, you are not going to sh- stop yourself from winning games by playing some of these cards. It's like, like <laughs> no. just, you can, you can, I, I encourage, I, my challenge to people is to go there and deliberately depower your decks a little bit, take out the, like some of the things that's just like, oh yeah, like obviously you play this cause it's like super strong and put in like play in your blue deck, put in wrong turn. Do you know wrong turn, Mitch? I love this card so much. I, I, I don't know. What's wrong turn too? Wrong turn is an instant. I, it costs uh, it's either two or three mana. I think it's. I think maybe it's three mana. Three mana blue instant. Um, that says, target player gains control of target creature you don't control. And that sounds hilariously funny. It is. It is surprisingly really good in the right scenarios. And this is the things like people like. Like, just don't understand that when a game goes so long and the and the threats get so big and boards get so out of control, the right scenario arises. It does. It it comes <laughs> yes. out eventually. And when it does and you go, yeah, I'm just going to wrong turn the Blightsteel Colossus you just played to the player who's about to take their turn here. And then, <laughs> whoops, I guess it's Uh-oh. attacking you for lethal now. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's um oh. you know there's just all sorts of stuff like that and if you if you just go ahead and let yourself break free of the bonds of efficiency a little bit and play some of the fun stuff you'll have a you'll have a good time i swear you will i promise i agree i think some of the most fun i've had playing commander has been playing commander with less than powerful decks yeah and then like i also when i build decks i like i i like to put in the cards that are like, oh, I got to play this because it's going to be so good with my commander. It's going to do this. Like, I play that stuff too, right? I'm not saying like, yeah. I'm not saying like you got to build your deck with draft chaff or whatever to have fun. That's definitely not no. the case. <laughs> but but there's definitely cases where you can you can let yourself live a little and play the play the lower power stuff and, like, and the niche stuff. You don't have to always put in all the two card combos or the two arenas for the same game every time. I, I, and, and I personally, I'm someone who doesn't like, I, I prefer variants in my commander games. So I'm at the point where I think I only have one deck that even has a demonic tutor in it anymore. And I, black's my favorite color. Most of my decks are black. Um, <laughs> and I think I only have one demonic tutor left and it's on the chopping block because like, I just, I've, I like detutor for lands and stuff all the time. <laughs> I've done that way too many times. God. It's like, it's like, whatever, like I, who even cares? Like, I don't need to, I, I, and, and believe me, ask, ask anyone, like I win my fair share of games for sure. So you don't, you just don't need to, you don't need to, but that's uh like I said, that's a topic for a YouTube video. I want to, I want to put out at some point, but I thought while we're on the subject of just like not keeping up with commander, it was an interesting thing to kind of bring up. So while we're on the topic of commander, what is your current favorite commander deck that you have my current favorite commander deck that's um actually i was gonna say it's a difficult question but it's not i have one deck that every time i play it um i have i have such a fun time and i think a lot of people would hardly even believe that that's the case but uh my favorite deck right now is my mono red delina wild mage deck um really that is not yes. the uh, the answer i would think of no Right. I, I know, I know, but you know what? That deck does everything. I, I First of all, that deck's extremely underestimated. Extremely underestimated. You, someone sits down with the mono red deck, you go, oh, yeah, whatever, like they're not even trying. Like, I mean, I, uh, uh, yeah, that's fair. Well, I cut out the infinite combo from it that one on turn five. So that um, turn five <laughs> with no ramp, like whatever, like turn four if I'm ramping. Like I, I cut that out. Um, it's And it's the combo was Delina doesn't get answered and then you play Port Razor. Um, which resulted in infinite combat steps and infinite port raisers. So, ah, yeah, that seems just pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was good. Um, so I cut that out because I'm I'm someone who cuts out infinite combos for my decks mm-hmm. because I just don't Damn. like having one 
win con that I try to go for every time because I want I try to win the game when I play, but I want it like I, I like actively want it to be a challenge for me to win the game. You want to play in different ways too, at the same time every time. Like yeah. So what Delina does for people who aren't aware, it's a four mana three two uh, creature. It's a human elf shaman i think it's like because she's a half elf from she's from dungeons and dragons from uh from yeah, the yeah. the whole like um what's the what's the realm forgotten forgotten realms she from that forgotten story realm, i think yeah. yeah yeah i'm not a dnd guy super like i played a bit but um yeah delina does uh when she attacks you choose a creature and then you roll a die a, D, a d20 if you uh roll a 1 through 14 you make a copy token copy of that creature that is a non-legendary token um, that then exiles at the end of the combat step that is tapped and attacking. And, you know, obviously in multiplayer, that means attacking the player or planeswalker of your choice. Um, and if you roll a 15 to 20, you make that copy and then you roll again. <laughs> so what okay, I... I love rolling. What I love to do in this deck, like we've got a few things. We've got like um, there's Barbarian class from uh, Adventures in Forgotten Realms that lets you re-roll you roll twice, take the highest anytime you have to roll a d20. So we got a little bit of that stuff. And like I literally play Gamble in the deck just so I can try and grab Barbarian <laughs> class as often as, as possible. <laughs> it's just my second copy of Barbarian class. Um, and uh and then we like we we play ways to like give Delina haste. We have plays to ways to make Delina attack safely. One of my favorite is the it's a classic play, which is I have Maze of Ith in the deck. Um, have her attack and just kick her out. Yeah, have her attack and then use my, my Maze of Ith on my own Delina. It's like no, she's not taking any combat damage this turn um, because your goal is to attack with Delina and then have some insane target to make. <laughs> Lots of copies of where where your opponents will be like, oh my god, what's happening right now? <laughs> so some of my favorites. There's some really basic stuff. Like I've many games I do the duplicate play, which is duplicate comes in, imprints a creature on him. Delina attacks. New duplicate comes in, imprints another creature on him. Maybe yeah, yeah, another yeah. one comes in. Who knows? Who knows how many duplicates are going to come in? Um, <laughs> depends on how high my rolls are. <laughs> um, fair, that's fair. like. You know, basic, but like that's exile X target creatures, which is uh, always a fun time. Um, but we have way more fun stuff than that. We have we have. Uh, um, oh, I should clarify, too. I also run stuff like um, the uh, there's a there's a harmonic prodigy that doubles the triggers of your shamans and wizards. Mm -hmm. Delina's a shaman with a triggered ability to make a copy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's pretty. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Th that's kind of juicy, too. Um, but yeah, we. Nice. One of my favorites is because it's like kind of good, but just mostly hilarious is uh good old combustible gear Hulk <laughs> coming in combustible. Uh, oh, I might be losing you again, Mitch here. Oh, there we oh. go. There we go. We got you coming back. Okay. Yeah. Com combustible gear Hulk is a, uh, is a um, like whatever six mana six, five with first strike or something. The stats don't matter. Who cares? Comes into play, choose an opponent um, and then, uh, they either let you draw three cards or you mill the top three cards of your deck and they take damage equal to the total mana value revealed. Um, just the other day, I last on this, this week I had played, or sorry, this past week I played a commander game with this deck. I played gear Hulk and I targeted a player and he was like, um, it was actually, it was, it was with ragey Randy, one of our patrons here. Um, and he was like, uh, okay, I'll take the damage. And I flipped 17 total mana value. <laughs> and he's like, okay, <laughs> go to, I guess I'm down to 10. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, like, oh, but, but then when you attack with Delina, then you go make a Gear Hulk, target you again, make a Gear Hulk, target you again. <laughs> Eventually you draw a lot of cards. <laughs> what? You mean they can't take damage forever? Yeah, they can't. Um, and then, and then one of my favorites, because people don't even realize like how out of control this gets is Torbran, Thane of Redfell. Oh God. Torbran, a uh, legendary creature who increases the damage all your red sources deal to opponents by two. Um, I, I was this close to killing Randy in that game. I had made, f uh, he was, he had like started comboing off with a blink deck and was gaining a ton of life. And I attacked in my last ditch effort with a plaster playing a Torbran. And I made three more copies of Torbran. So everything was dealing plus 
uh, plus eight damage on every attacking Torbrand now. And if I needed, I think I needed to make two more copies to get him to, to actually kill him that game. But it was like a oh. really long shot effort. Hey, I mean, um, if you're real high, you're real high, right? Yep, yep. And I mean, I always have the out with that deck. That's what I love. Like, there's always an out that I can find. Um, and I love a deck like that. So, um, yeah, that, that deck is just a blast to play. There's just so many. I mean, I can't even get it. Like, I'd sit here all day and just talk about the combos oh, in that yeah, deck. But. Sure. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that, that is probably my favorite one. How about, how about you, Mitch? What's your favorite commander deck right now? Oh, my favorite commander deck, probably not even close. It's a uh, Feldegriff. Oh my God. Group hug. Yep. Group hug with one way to win the game in there. What's the one way to win? I, it usually involves, uh, it involves smothering tithe. Oh, disgusting. Yeah, that's it. Smothering tithe. And then I just have you draw your entire deck. If I don't find it, you're getting a lot of cool card draw, extra land drops, free creatures. How do, what do you is, find it? You draw your what deck. do you do? What do you do when you find? How do you how do you mill their deck with Smothering Tithe? Oh, I'm not mill deck. So like I'll play like Stroke of Genius. I'll make someone draw like X amount of cards. Oh, okay. So each okay. card they draw, I'll make a trick okay. token. And like I have one number. Each player draws X cards. So like we'll all draw 10. I'll make 40 treasure. I'll have my other one. That will all draw 40. I'll make a hundred and twenty, <laughs> and like, right, and, and those fifty cards. I probably found my third X card drawn. That's that sounds just like you, actually. That sounds about right. <laughs> Otherwise, oh. it's just yeah, it's cards like um, Envelope Garden, a Rites of Flourishing. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's it. That's my deck. It's just group hug until either I win or someone else is. Go super far ahead with all the advantage I gave him. It's usually the guy sitting right after me. Right, sure. They're the one who they're the one who's uh, able to take they it after you benefit. set everything up. Sure. Yep. That makes sense. That makes sense. Well, Mitch, how about we uh, how about we dive into the topic for the day now? Um, all right. Let's uh, let's talk about some heroes. Yes. So, um, 2022 has been uh, has been a, a very full year for My Hero Academia. My Hero Academia released officially, finally released in 2021, um, and 2022 has seen the release of two sets: uh, Crimson Rampage set two and Heroes Clash set three. Um, there have been some tournament seasons, circuits, online events, in person events. Um, and all sorts of Jasco shenanigans, Mitch. I'd love you to lead our conversation uh, here. How do you how do you feel like 2022 has been for my hero? What do you want to talk about first? Um, so do I start off with the good, the bad, or the in between? What do you think? We're gonna cover yeah. everything. So why don't you why don't you start off with the good? Let's start with a little uh, the a good. little positive. Start with the good. All right, all right. Um, so just the card game in general itself, um, with these few new sets, I think. It's got a lot of good depth in terms of like card play, champion selection, um, and just terms of like back and forth. I think there's a lot of really good design choices they made, as well as a lot of really good comp choices they made going forward. So part of the bad is the start of the year, because of Rampage, they had the whole provisional promo fiasco, I like to call it. Right. Where they had these provisional promos that you only get from tournaments. And they were legal right away. Yes. So if you went to the first tournament, they're legal, and you got yourself a few of these um, stadium cards. That was the hit thing back then. Um, you yes. had just a, a huge advantage in everybody else, and they were selling at one point for like a hundred dollars a piece, like a second tournament, just so you can get your copies and try and you get a little bit of advantage out. And I think stadium that was, was a hell of a card. Yeah, I think that first design choice they had was. Garbage. Absolutely terrible. They shouldn't have exclusive promos with unique mechanics hidden behind tournament attendance. Um, as as the only method of getting them, right? Yes, yes. And uh, the way they fix that, which is the good thing, um, in set three, they changed their way how to do it, where they'll now be legal at the end of that competitive season. So you have the entire season either to get points to buy them, to go to events and buy them, or another good thing they had is they had the store provisional championships, which got a lot more of these copies of cards out into the player base. Yes. You know what? That the store provisional, I think, is is the best 
Um, I mean, like, I think in general, just having the redemption up and also their efforts to, like, keep the redemption on time, um, t- timely shipments and stuff, those are those are probably... I don't know. Maybe those are actually actually the most important elements of it because that's what allows kind of everyone to participate. But the the store champs events, um, we had a really positive experience at ours. I think everyone seemed to have a great time. We had uh, Clint Badger, one of the one of the uh, devs or playtesters, um, I think devs, uh, it came down and um, was playing with us, and and he was a lot. It was a lot of fun to get to play with those guys and and chat with him a bit. Um, so we had a great event there, and and from what I could understand is that like a lot of people really enjoyed just having a wad of those promos sent to their local store, so that their everyone in the local was able to start getting a hold of more copies of them. So yeah, I think 100%. that was a good thing. It was, it was, it's always good to have more cards go into the players' hands in terms of like a competitive stance. I think one thing we're going to have like sort of a trend in this conversation is going to be, um, I think. I think there were this is the first of a number of mishaps with Jasco you're gonna go into. Oh um, yeah, yeah, yeah. However, I'm gonna I'm gonna just preface everything here by saying um I personally believe Jasco has a really, really positive there's a really, really positive um element of Jasco that isn't actually mimicked in a lot of other companies either. But they they are earnestly I know they are earnestly trying their best always to address these issues there at no point are they ever doing this like yeah this is gonna line our pockets or whatever i'm pretty no, sure I'm... it's just they are doing their best to make the game as good as they can for the players it's just and it, it it's it doesn't always you know it's like there's i think i think handling one of these tcgs is harder than people realize too like there's there's a lot of people you're trying with different values and different needs that you're trying to appease and you know well well on the one hand you're like okay like we're gonna put these great promos out and people are gonna love coming to the events and have fun competing for them and then suddenly everyone's like why can't i get the promos for the event to play in it it's like well i but that, oh, i yeah. thought you wanted to come to the event like there's, the point is there's a there's two sides to each coin right and the point that i want to make is that jasco and and in fact, at, at usually a faster timeline than like than um and this is coming up with the conversation with Mike last last week or yes yesterday, <laughs> um, that Bandai is does respond to these things. They do take feedback, but it's it's kind of slow. They're pretty slow to respond to things, um, and they do. Jasco is actually and maybe some of the my hero players here who are really into the game are gonna are gonna disagree with me but you guys are trust me here at this point jasco is pretty fast getting to per- solving these problems solving the tournament thing in one tournament season would have been a miracle for bandai an absolute miracle from god to have that solved in a single tournament season um and that's what happened for my hero yeah, yeah. They they were quick to react and they were very accepting to feedback, which is wonderful. Great thing for the company, which yes. is why I think it leads to a lot of the players willing to trust them going forward because like, they've shown that they're trying to make changes and get better and learn from any mistakes they make. Right. I think probably the biggest problem they had to deal with was the fact that the company itself, I don't think, was ready for how big the game was going to get and how fast it got. Totally agree. Yeah. Um, so, so people who aren't aware, My Hero Academia is the cur- sort of the current iteration of of the Universes card game, which was the rename of the Universal Fighting System card game. This game has been around for uh, a very long time, um, well over a decade. I feel like yeah, almost at least, at least ten years. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think I think closer to fifteen. I had this number in my head like months ago, but now I can't remember exactly when the, it came out. With the it launched with the Penny Arcade expansion um set at the very first penny arcade expo i believe um so it's been around a long time um and for a long time it's been a niche game with fighting game properties they started expanding to anime with like cowboy bebop and they started they just started doing video games the mega man at some point um and have like like toyed around with those but like let's be straight up like as as much as we love the retro gaming goodness of Mega Man uh as much as we love the anime classic Cowboy Bebop these are not these are not properties that are bringing in players by the droves there's not no they're very well again they're great properties and stuff it's just they're 
they're older. They're a lot more niche in who likes them or who even knows about them in the first place. And My Hero Academia was the the first franchise they brought in that was actually like a sort of, even though it took a little, unfortunately, COVID sort of delayed um, the release. It was like slightly less timely, <laughs> but it still is a sort of on the precipice, like popular modern anime um, that that has currently releasing seasons that top charts you know when they're when they're being released so yeah the anime is ongoing the manga is ongoing it's it is right now at the forefront of anybody who's watching anime or anything like that it's there you see it all the time yes yep um and that has caused i think you're totally right that has caused uh, a lot more players to get into the game um and so Jasco, I, I I totally agree with you. My take, my take, just like watching everything, is that like it seemed like Jasco was trying really hard to be really prepared for the amount of players and the amount of product and everything, and and still weren't really there for it. Didn't have the infrastructure kind of built out, especially like the demand um, globally was another thing that we saw. Oh, and we saw anything, yeah. In 2022, we this we we kicked off the year with the release of Crimson Rampage for north america and around the time crimson rampage released i feel like actually shortly after crimson rampage released set one finally released <laughs> in europe um and and because we have we have in our discord we have some uh uk players some germany players um who i remember we were running this league and um crimson rampage came out in the middle of the league i'm remembering this now and I had like like when the first week launched to the Crimson Rampage was out and we had people who were there like, well, I just got set one. Can I still play in the league? Like, well, yeah, of course <laughs> you can. And they're like, sure, I'll just like I'll just have play on a handicap. That's fine. I won't have yeah, Crimson yeah. Rampage until the last week of the league. Like it was like a couple weeks after set one released in Europe, set two <laughs> released in Europe. So that's how delayed everything was, though. Yeah. Again, again, a lot of it has to do with like the whole delays from COVID. Getting yeah. like enough product made, enough shipments stepped out, and again, just also demand. Demand was much more than I'm sure they were expecting to start. Here's what you're gonna see too. I think in general, the the smaller the company is for your card game, the bigger the impact is uh, of of shipping delays and COVID and everything. You just don't have the you don't have ev the infrastructure already built. So you don't have the timelines pushed ahead enough already. Like usually the smaller a card game is, the more they're kind of flying by the seat of their pants to the point where like some smaller card games, um, like I could confirm this for, for Metacross when we were developing for it. That was one set at a time. If you want to yep. know what the next set is, I'm, I don't know. I didn't know what it was <laughs> and until <laughs> then the set released and then it said, okay, set two is Green Lantern. Like, okay, cool. Let's start developing it, I guess. Um, and, uh, but you know, like I, I, I know my hero is a little further in development, um, than the other games, but still that means that their, their timelines aren't, aren't to the point where they're like, they have everything in the warehouses with plenty of time. And we were talking about this in the Digimon episode also like Bandai, even though they're like, they're becoming a bigger card game publisher, they're still smaller than, than Yu-Gi-Oh! Pokemon, uh, magic. Yeah. It's and hard they, to hear those big three. Yeah. But they, they, that means they saw bigger impact from delays um, due to shipping problems due to COVID than like games like Magic, which saw like no issues with delays whatsoever in 2020. Well, they had like maybe other than secret layers, but things, but other secret layers. About, Those are all we'll talk about secret layers. No problem. <laughs> Come back next week. <laughs> I can't wait to talk oh. about that actually. Um, but yeah, sorry. I'm, 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 I'm sort of playing off what you're saying, but also sort of derailing you. So please continue your, your talk about, uh, about the sets. Yeah. Um, so again, with um, where were we at? Uh, with, with with part of the bad stuff. Um, yes. So again, part of these like delays of shipping and stuff. Um, we had the extended period of time between set two and set three, and that that was a problem. It was a problem in terms of like player engagement, player enjoyment of the game, mm. in terms of like a stale formats. It led to yeah. a lot of people just being dissatisfied towards the end and not wanting to really try and play anything or change anything up just... i want to i want to really talk about that actually because if you if you there's okay like i said jasco a number of little little things that i won't even want to say missteps honestly things like the the promo thing i don't even call that a misstep i call that just say like again it's like not you know it's just like an in, a program in its infancy it needed to iterate on yeah, it they iterated on it totally fine and it's and it's and i don't have a problem with that personally um, but 
I this is what I think is the biggest misstep of My Hero Academia in 2022, which is that they they were and 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 perhaps it's shipping delays, perhaps it's it's infrastructure not being in place, whatever. But like set two, Crimson Rampage has a number of good characters. It has a number of good cards, but overall, I consider that a pretty weak set. Um, and I I don't think I'm alone in considering that. No. Um, it, it's, it was, a, it was a week set that had a, uh, was it more, it actually I think might've been more than six months. It was six, six to seven months, I think between it and the release of heroes clash. Yeah, at at um, least six, but yeah, I think it might've been a little more. Oh, ha- following up your set one, which by the way, set one for my hero is a very strong set. It's very good. It's like, it's a classic, <laughs> like overloaded set one full of good As cards. A classic set one new card game thing where set one yes. is like, oh, these cards are so great. Oh, these cards are too good. Yeah, yeah. And then they can't power creep of the game right out the gate. So it's like, okay, set two's pulled back a little bit clearly because they they were worried about things being too strong. So like we assume, I guess it's speculation, but yeah. um, but then following up set one with set two, and then waiting over half a year to get set three, only having the set of kind of weak cards to play off of, and then the set one stuff people have been using for like, by the way, the between set one and two was like six months also or something i think it was like an extremely long time also um that that unfortunately i think was a momentum hit to the game i 100 percent agree there's nothing that's gonna kill a card game more than to having those huge gaps between new stuff and new products again there's also the other, the other side where if you have too much new stuff or too much shiny products it leads to burnout which is problem with magic at the moment but it's again yeah. next time <laughs> are you uh, are you sure you didn't want to do this podcast with me oh <laughs> uh, you know uh, we'll see we'll see i might be able to be talked and do some of it <laughs> <laughs> maybe we can do a three person i will i'll we'll figure that out you'll find out next week <laughs> what we decided <laughs> um but yeah it's it uh, and i want to be clear too i don't think my hero academia is in danger of dying right this is the this is the big takeaway that i want people to to impress upon themselves here i think 2022 had a number of problems for my hero academia there are also a number of highlights which we haven't gone through all of yet but universes is more popular than it's ever been and, and it's if not even close he is not close and if universes lived in the in the like you know mortal combat soul caliber like whatever era if if it lived then it's gonna be fine now like there's it's it's not gonna be an issue if you like the game if you play the game don't i would not go into this taking the what we're saying this pocket be like ooh, things are looking grim like no no, not at all no 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 um things could be better right um but and i think i think it was a hit to momentum it wasn't a hit to uh, this, like, it wasn't like the player base is dead. It was just that, like, the the speed that was gathering slowed down. The acceleration is slower. Um, and, there was and not I, but, much excitement going around or talking about the game because, hey, we've had this set two for six months and the cards from set two were just kind of eh. Yeah, what, there just wasn't, what was there to talk about, you know? That was the, that was the issue. Alley Haymaker. That, well, yeah, that was a good card. <laughs> um, so then we went into Heroes Clash, with, which launched uh, October, end of October, something like that. Whenever I put up the... the yeah, um, um, it launched the last two weeks of October in there because I knew it was legal right before the first Nationals. Yes. Because so I had to do a lot of study up on that to get ready for Nationals. And how was set three, Heroes Clash? I think set three, uh, a lot stronger than set two. Yes. Uh, uh, not even a close comparison for that kind of stuff. Um, I agree. So set completely. three, while it's not like set one in terms of power level, because set three is what they call like a, a backlog set. They went in and they filled out a lot of the other kits to make them more up to standard of what the first two characters got in terms of like card selection or power. So like they went and gave promo characters actual cards and kits versus like, hey, this is a promo character. Here you go. Now we have kids for him. So like Midnight, she got her her named attack and her ad mm-hmm. and her foundations that help her out. It's nice when they support those niche promo characters with kits and these kind of sets to make them more viable. Yes. Um, 
I, I think there's also a number of like just it's it's a set that's clearly just a, a a just a mix of all sorts of different little bits and bobs. Here's a card for this character. There's like an ultra rare is like a random like Bakugo support card from like set one Baku. By the way, I love that deck now. I'm I'm a huge fan of Bakugo oh. one now. That it's, that card is so much fun. Oh. Stun grenade. Uh, well, I, I shouldn't say it or we'll get taken down like the Facebook group. <laughs> 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 oh hey wait 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 let's talk about that really quick because you i don't think we're going to be able to get away with talking about my hero in 2022 without talking about the facebook debacle with stun grenade no no, no i mean no, no, no. Spe- it's speculated to be about stun grenade but for people who aren't aware the my hero academia ccg facebook page the official page by jasco supported uh-huh. by funimation all this stuff got taken down not once but twice twice and the speculation was um this reminds me of the old dragon ball z chevrolet like rumor that's going around what? shout out to my retro dvz players there's a card that says chevrolet on it because it's the the farmer from the first season who has, a chevy. He has a chevy yeah as a uh, orange truck lift was the name of the card and um mm. it was missed in the sheet uh to be printed foil or something um, and then there was like someone started this rumor that was like it's because it says chevrolet on it and they had to pull it from the sheet or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's like one of my oh, favorite my rumors God. from that game. Um, but yeah, so now like the I, people speculate it's because it, the, they were talking about stun grenade in a post or something. And then Facebook bots just like flagged it as like talking oh, about stun grenade, weapons. That's violence. Something. Yeah. Yeah, and and the page got taken down, but then it got taken down a second time, like weeks later after they went through a long effort of getting it reinstated. I don't actually know right now if it's up or down. <laughs> I'm not sure. It's as of right now, it's still up. Okay, it well, it came back not up too again. Long ago from it. Whether it's um, down for a third time, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> when you're when this releases, it'll be down a third time. <laughs> um, oh. yeah, but like that, you know, that was what that really was to me was just like. Another another small piece of just kind of what what always appears to be just a slight small fire going on somewhere in in the My Hero Academia card game. It's just like there's always it's one. just like whether it's bigger spot, this is somewhere it's fine. It's fine. It it's feels like bear. that's just we're not even gonna get into like the recent stream nonsense. I have no I'm taking no sides and no opinions on any of the well, like that is outside of things I want to talk about. Yes, totally. But like, talk about what they need to talk about for that kind of stuff. Yes, agreed. Um, but there's there's uh, there there's always something, some kind of small fire going on. And and Jasco again, they're always doing what they can to answer. It. And sometimes it doesn't it doesn't even feel like it's fair that like this stuff <laughs> some of this stuff happens. It's I don't just get like back to back to back. It's like why oh. they, if Jasco was a person, they'd, they'd just be like the Charlie Brown. If they of like just some <laughs> there's always something going wrong. The, someone's pulling the football or they get a rock in their sack or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, just a lot of a lot of growing pains, a lot of growing pains to get through. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true, um, and I think I, maybe that's a great way to like highlight that your twenty twenty two was maybe for my hair academia a year of growing a uh, growing pains. Um, I, the game hit its growth spurt. They tried to prepare for it right away, but going from universes to my hair academia, it had a very fast growth spurt and its voice was changing and it was had hair growing in weird places. And suddenly it felt weird things about girls and like, (laughs) (laughs) and, and now it's just trying to like figure out how, how to be an adult in, in, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's trying its best to stay like a regular job, hold on to nine to five. Yeah, and and I, you know, I still I stand by where I placed it on the tier list. Um, I think this tier list video actually got very popular. I haven't watched it. I really like this yeah, tier list of, video. A lot of hot takes on that tier list video. You know what? That's what a tier list is for, though. Yeah, like the, from right, the yeah. comment section and from me. Like straight up, straight up. I hold. By the way, if I can just say this, I hold absolutely no grudges about anyone who disagrees with me for any reason. I, and you can go ahead. You can blast me in the comments. That's just fine with me because I honestly, a tier list is a set of opinions, and um, you are free to have them, and I'm free to have them, and it's beautiful that we can sit here on YouTube and talk about our opinions about card games. Um, I don't. I did not mean any ill will by like yeah. if I blasted your game in there. I tried to be pretty even handed. I so like I don't. Yeah. I don't quite I didn't understand see any big problems. No, I mean it seems yeah, like but, you have reasonable ideas. Whether 
you might have had to have experienced someone else. That's totally fair. But, again, but in, if if I if I hurt your feelings, I'm sorry. But I I certainly didn't mean to. Um, but I love that we can have these these this sort of like controversial takes like this. And I think the hot take video or the hot take I just called it the hot take video. <laughs> <laughs> I think the tier list video um, is is a very is I think it's an entertaining watch, and I think a lot of people feel that way too, based on based on the analytics I'm seeing about it too. So yeah, um, I I enjoyed it. Well, I enjoyed the whole stream, but the video for the tier list was nice. And I stand by where I put my hero on there. I gave my hero academia an A. The I the reason I stand by that is because the game itself is excellent. Just extremely good game. It's so fun to play. Um it and and I I, I give it an A because it's so good to play that it it for me it washes out some things that other people would weight more highly to cause them to place it lower. If you don't think it's an A, that's why. It's that's just straight up why is because you weight the uh, those other elements more highly than um, than me. So they're they're like pulling it down farther when I'm I'm like allowing the strength of the game to prop it up for me. So um, it's sure, yeah. Yeah, and it's it's just like an opinion thing. Now, uh, do, I have my own problems too. My problem is Mineta too, but <laughs> <laughs> I I wonder what happened there. Huh. Oh, I've multiple tournaments in a row. I'm tired of playing this character. I'm tired of it. Um, my and my hope my hope for 2023. So this I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of work this in 2022. We saw set two set two Crimson Rampage was. Uh, was unlike set three was a set basically just focused on the characters that came in it it introduced yep. a ton more characters like 16 character set or something and every character had to have a bunch of cards so um you know of course in in my hero you're free to mix and match those and there are cards from set two that you play absolutely there are lots of there are a number of very good cards high value target is a card that gets played in like all sorts of decks because it's just a solid one check or one cost foundation um and there's lots of cards. There. <laughs> yes. There's lots of good. So set two, while it might have been weak overall, the cards that were good in that set were really good. Yeah. Um, however, uh, then when they, you know, they they aren't, they weren't able to do what they did in set three, which is just kind of really respond to what some uh, resources needed. Set three really was able to go through and go like, you can see in the design of it, you can be like, wow, here's a bunch of one diff foundations with like low blocks that all have a way to remove foundations from your. Yes. Uh, actually, they have a different different blocks, but um, yeah, you know the point a is huge like problem, yeah, because getting they, out of deadlock was rough. Yes, they were introducing numbers that were important. One diff foundations were needed for several resources. They were introducing effects that were important. Removing your own foundations was necessary for games that were going to deadlock, so you could get yourself back out of it. Um, and and then block block uh zones in particular were needed in some some uh with with decent numbers are needed in some resources and said three went a good distance to like making things like void is now a, like actually a playable symbol void whereas before it was like zero diff foundation now yeah yeah void was playing void before it was like straight throwing the game like period it was hard. <laughs> like you just you just quit you uphill battle if you're playing void shout before. out to those uh those voiders had one players that was rough. yeah 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 they they were really they were really trying their best and and i i do um i do appreciate that but now it's definitely a more playable resource to play however that's great we've got numbers fixed we've got resources uh kind of a little more balanced we've got some uh, well i don't you're gonna have your own take on that i'm sure but um yeah. <laughs> we we've uh we've got effects well, there's a few that are out of balance Yes, I agree with that. But but there's more that are more playable is the point. They brought up some more of them yes, to the point where you can play them. They brought a lot of them up to make them, almost all of them viable. There's however, the liars, but... however, there oh. are still some types of effects, some characters that just simply do not have reasonable answers in the game. Um, and and Mineta 2 is my favorite example of this because you try, you try to find momentum hate that doesn't just suck. Like it's like, or is like awkward to use or like, there's like yeah, a couple um, symbols that have a couple pieces that are like, all right, like making a stand or whatever is, I think that's the one where it's like, you can flip it to make both players pitch momentum or something. Um, like there's some like cards that are like, okay. And like, you can put them in, but like 
some symbols just like literally go, oh, you're playing Mineta. Well, I, ha I my only option to win this game is to rush aggro turn one. Hope I get lucky unless I'm playing like, I will get into this in a sec. Hope I get lucky and, and can beat you <laughs> turn one and then stall out the game turn two. That's or game two. That's my only thing I can do to win this game. Um, yeah, it's a very, uh, very feels bad when, when your game plan is to, to like win game one and then just draw out game two. It's, it's, and I think that's a lot of Mineta's game plan too. Mineta, in yep. terms of like a deck as Mineta, um, the biggest problem with Mineta is finishing games. And, and I think that is not a reasonable balancing factor on a no. card. <laughs> no, it's not. I, I, I will straight up, so this is this is from a game design perspective, but the the card design shouldn't be balanced by uh the the tournament timing guidelines. <laughs> I think that's a I ridiculous. Mean, I, I don't think that's how they intended to balance it like that. But that's how the players are looking at it. Because a lot of the players are like, well, if I can't finish games with this deck, I can't get wins, so I can't top cut. Right. I think if the rounds were longer, we would probably see more Mineta and more answers to Mineta. So, in the few decks that are top right now, that are playing against Mineta, they have options, like um, Kirishima. We have the one diff foundation that kicks a card out of the, of the card pool. Yes. Um, also in Kirishima, we have access to attacks like Karate Shop, which is a stun effect and momentum hate, all in one card. Yep. There's there's some of those um, definitely. I I just think that uh, it's the two the two things that Mineta does best, which are stuffing card pool and get, gathering momentum, and then just like you know b making it so you literally can't stop him once he has too much momentum. So like the two things that answer him are are removing stuff from your card pool and removing momentum. Momentum has more hate options than removing from card pool clearing your card pool has has very few options it's there the, is the, if, not a lot though if you're not playing the three symbols on um i can't i can never literally can never remember this card but the one you're talking about where you clear the card pool yeah. um if you if you're not playing those three symbols then i i don't know what you do if you if you think like oh i need to tech against Mineta. so you just have to like kill Mineta turn one <laughs> or whatever before he gets momentum. i mean so the biggest thing of meta is if Mineta ever becomes too big of a problem again, we're going to see a lot more Momos. Because Momo just dumpsters Mineta. It's not a game. Not even close. Sure. Because Mineta sets your pool. You choose to stuff it with a weapon foundation. And then you just build it back down. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, that's reasonable. That's a reasonable take that there's... I think there is... There's, I, that's really funny, too. Just, like, thematically, that Momo is the one that's good against <laughs> Mineta, too. <laughs> uh that's kind of interesting um but i i i feel like the problem is that the game the should card be was called forcing surrender that's what it was forcing surrender that's it yep yep yeah. that is in the sideboard of my bakugo deck but not available for the uh very fun in genium i was playing the other day <laughs> no, no 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 unfortunately um i i can appreciate and understand a rock paper scissors metagame i totally can at, a, at the competitive level um i don't think the difference should be as stark as it is currently with some of the competitive decks tier tier one decks and tier two decks i don't i think i think in your game you should always strive in in most card games that people should strive the designer should strive to make it so that tier two and three decks are not um, they will be able to win unless they're playing against tier one, but is more that there, there is a difference in consistency of winning between them in general. It, it, their, their goal should be to, to, to reduce the size of the gap yeah. between those. I, I agree. Um, I think a big problem with that with my hero going forward is like the first set or two, they had no feedback yet. Sure. They have their own witnesses and their own groups of people, but in any card game, the players are going to be better at building decks than the testers for it because not only Definitely. do they just have more competitive experience maybe or just like there's just vast numbers versus like let's say they have like maybe we'll say 10 we'll set on 10 they might have more probably have more but we'll say they have 10 testers of the game those 10 testers only have so much time in a day and so much 
time to play test cards before they have to ship them out for production and printing and such. Versus the competitive player base, there's hundreds of players testing hundreds of different decks of combinations they just didn't have time for. Um, so I think going forward with the new sets, like set four, set five, they'll probably do a better job to flesh out more of the um, the counter hate and make it so like if you're on air, you're just shit out of luck for um, stuffing hate. Yeah. That, and I actually, I, I really like the point that you brought up here because my, I, you know, my experience with uh, development also was exactly that. And, and plus another thing that people don't realize that goes into to development, as much as you don't want to believe that it's a thing, a lot of people really like to just, just assume like developers are either uh, doing a great job or they're awful, which is <laughs> like, that's, that generally, it's, it's just like, they're the one case of the case either way, but <laughs> it's usually actually just the awful side. Most, most players are very <laughs> oh. happy to just immediately jump down the throats of, of, yeah. uh, play testers and developers. Um, there's ever any one broken combo, like, God, why didn't these testers see this? What were they thinking? Yeah. What, well, here's what they were thinking. It's, it's something, it's a psychological phenomenon called groupthink. Um, that is a, it is a completely real thing. Uh, that happens in playtesting, and um, I have experienced it firsthand. I've, 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 you know, we've we had when we were doing Metacross, we had several different playtesting groups that had developed their own particular metagames um, as they were playtesting, and we were always actively trying to, you know, talk to each other and being like, okay, send me your send. Let's let's see what your deck lists are because like currently we think that deck's terrible and like it would die in our decks in our metagame. So like, what's making it win in yours? Here's what's winning in ours, and like trying to like trade the ideas and figure it out because if if everyone just gets stuck on this own like internal metagame, you yeah, all you had to do was like miss one interaction that then like completely changes not just like one deck like but then then this other deck is too powerful so then we got to nerf this thing and then like when the players get a hold of it they notice the interaction they play the good deck and then this deck that you thought was too powerful you had to nerf is just like not even close to good anymore it's just terrible now and like and you can see how everything just kind of cascades out of there so it's a complicated endeavor it really is it's really a tough job for them to have to do with that kind of stuff because again they only have so much people so much time and again like you said a group think if one group thinks this deck of strategy is super strong and stuff everybody's get the same idea in their head and they're not going to try and like see if they can't counter something that's already in in the set they made um so a few examples of that for magic uh, <laughs> um so obviously magic's had their ups and downs in terms of like card design um like oko big example is oko oof that is what we that is what everybody considers an awful card design choice that testers failed on. Mm -hmm. yeah, sometimes they just make mistakes and they miss stuff. It happens. People that are was Tarmogoyf. human. Tarmogoyf was Tarmogoyf. a was a straight up just like an error. Someone didn't realize the plus one was on the effect, uh, and and it was like a late minute, a last minute change to the cards like mana cost and stuff, and then it just like printed it and was I mean, suddenly so even like then, when Tarmogoyf first came out, no one played it. It was, it was, it was, it was yeah. Like, it was like, it was considered almost bulker at the time. Cause it's just, yes. Again, at that time, there wasn't any planeswalkers yet. There wasn't, um, tribal yet. So it, it lost two of the different card types to make it extra strong. Yeah. And tribal, tribal became a big one as people were playing things like Tarfire just to power up, um, yeah. Tarmogoyf by two. And you, if, if you start your turn one with fetch land into Tarfire, they're, they're one drop or something. You have three card types in your graveyard. You have land instant and goblin and, and tribal and tribal goblin. The goblin yeah. doesn't matter, but tribal. And then, uh, turn two, you play your Tarmogoyf and it's a three, four for two. <laughs> and your opponent's yeah. like, uh, <laughs> Tarmogoyf came up before Lorwyn did. So all that stuff just, raised it up They're like oh this is a problem we introduced two new card types now this card is a higher ceiling and wait sorry is a four five because you killed their creature and creatures in the graveyard too my bad ah, okay. even it was a six <laughs> it was a it was a five six if it was an artifact creature that's how crazy tarmogoyf <laughs> got back to that. <laughs> it's not yes. now it's like not played uh, yeah no, now, um, it's, not now good enough, it's like a boomer card crazy enough yeah um yeah so so um, I, I guess I wanted to I wanted to bring up that whole side of things because I it sounded like I might have been like blasting the developers there and I'm absolutely not um, because your point is really really um, I, I take it very well because 
I agree. Set one and two, there just wasn't really the feedback yet. Um, I, I don't know if they just had, like, I don't blame the playtesters at all for whatever they thought was going on when they printed set two. And if they thought it was like a oh, good set, all. like they didn't powerful have set, feedback like yet. maybe, like maybe they, maybe in their meta, like, uh, I don't know, maybe like May was unbeatable and uh, who's someone bad from said Grand Torino was like right. dominating or something. I don't know. I have no idea what's going on in their internal He's meta. so cool, but. Yeah, he's he's so close, but not just not quite. Um, but uh, see, so yeah, I don't blame them at all. But what I do want to see, I want to see um, what I didn't see in Heroes Clash was the first set where they really got to kind of like respond to what I think was missing in the resources. I would love to see in 2023 um, them to start to shore up, produce cards that that are hitting a little bit of a wider variety of symbols that allow them to answer some of the tier. Uh, the higher tier strategies that are either like oppressive or moving too fast or something to allow more decks to kind of compete with them because it's it's that's i think in in my opinion for like gameplay wise that's the biggest thing that's missing is that there are, we we have a few too many like uh rail railgun style decks people like to call them in this where you you can just kind of like blast your opponent without caring on turn two and, yeah, yeah. and win the game okay tokiyami kind of decks, froppy like, interact uninteractive that's the biggest problem with those kind of things if they're too consistent yep um and then on the other one out of 10 games they can high roll you that's fine that's just very interesting card game yes and then the other side of the coin is these like these decks, which are really just exemplified by Mineta. Mineta 2 is just the best one to pick on because his two sides of his kit are the sides that have the, I think, some of the least potent uh, answer cards available. Card, card pool stuffing and momentum. Um, momentum, again, less so depending on your symbols. You have some options, but a lot of the momentum hate is, is um, very reined in compared to what UFS had. Um, and... So like, you know, like I think the like a big example is like that Bakugo started a card that's like um it, it they they lose life equal to their momentum. Great. Oh yeah, yeah. And if it hits and then get rid of it all. If it hits, they have to or if it's if it's blocked, they have to lose their momentum, I think oh, is what it blocked. is. Oh okay. Yep. Okay, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, if it's sure. and but that's key, right? Because it's like Okay, I'll how much does it do? Four? All right, take it. All right, I'll take four. <laughs> and then you're like, like damn yeah. it that was my momentum hate <laughs> like that's that isn't really momentum hate that's like it can no. push the win if you've already gotten Mineta to the point where that will kill him but if you haven't yet and if your opponent knows that's your momentum hate they're gonna try and play around that yeah, for being, I, like being the case i think probably the biggest problem um with the whole momentum versus thing is like Sure, there's cards that are out there. There's a few of them. Some of them are pretty good. Um, the problem is, in terms of like momentum overall, there's not a lot of cards in the game where stacking momentum is super great. There's a few, and when they have, they're there, they're great. But usually, if you yeah. have it, you want to use it and get rid of it as fast as you can. It's like, hey, if we're playing Meteor Shower, we're going to get one or two. We're going to start pitching them to do other stuff. Um, if there's more decks that focus on stacking up, two three or four then moment but moment would probably see more cyborg and magic play sure yeah and, may, and maybe that's part of it too is just that like when it feels bad to like stuff momentum hate into your sideboard when it's it's literally only there if someone happens to be like memeing minetta two on you or something yeah, and even then like... and then so a lot of the decks they use momentum they use it to increase damage or speed which yeah. usually deck can, should already deal with damage or speed by itself. So like if they right. had EX4 on their move, now it's a 12 speed move. Well, a Do lot think... of decks, if they can run it, they run speed reduction already. Right, right. Do you think um, the fact that we don't have the multiple mechanic brought back into the game yet is part of the issue, actually, then? It's like, I sort hope of they never bring that back in the game. Never. But see, never see... bring it back. It's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it can stay away. Yes, the hell out of here. No thanks. Multiple wasn't, but see, the, the the reason I bring that up is because multiple was one of the strongest ways to use re your momentum. Um, yeah. <laughs> the, if you were a momentum building deck, you're basically, I, I mean, for a lot of the decks when we were like this in this like sort of 2018, 2019 era when we were playing, the momentum building decks were simply building out to do like multiple shenanigans. Um, and 
you know, for good reason, multiple let you turn your momentum into free attacks that your opponent then had to either take or or try and block or whatever, which felt terrible either way. Yeah, um, it felt awful. Uh, and if what you're telling me right now is that the issue is that momentum is not doesn't have enough strong payoffs and the payoffs it has you're already dealing with with your with building your deck you're what it sounds like you're telling me is that if multiple were in the game it would create a payoff for momentum that you don't naturally have an, a simple way of dealing with in your deck and your in your in your tech you're already running that then would increase your desire to play momentum hate and potentially allow stronger momentum hate to exist, which would then allow more decks to have happen to have a check to Mineta. <laughs> Sounds like that's I mean, what you're telling me. That all lines up, but I think set three did a good job of introducing a few cards here and there that use momentum outside of that effect. Like uh, Shiragi's new attack, that you can pitch to momentum okay. to drain for five. Um, cards like... Fierce War, not Fierce Roland, um, Xeno Hair, that you can use well momentum to gain 10 speed. Um, there's a few of those in the set, like Cool Student is another example. That was not set three, but... I love Cool Student. Of ways. Cool yeah. Student is a cool card. I think people people slept on Cool Student for a while, and I think people are now really, really... I've seen more decks that are starting to figure out that, like, hang on a second. I, yeah, I, can't, I can't bounce stuff to my hand like Froppy, but it doesn't matter when every attack I'm throwing, I get plus two on the check on, so... And then at the end of it, you can put that on top for a free five check. Yep, free five check right at the end that you, which is like a seven check if you used it right before. Yeah. So, um, no, I think again that's a problem with just the depth of the card pool. I think again with set four, set five, we'll probably see these more fleshed out. But I don't yeah. think they want to bring multiple back, and I don't think I want to see it brought back. The main <laughs> reason fair. is because as a newer player to a card game, the idea of multiple is a hard mechanic to teach and understand. Mm, sure. I think they could bring something maybe similar back, but I'm not sure how they would do that. Yeah. It, the idea it could of be. having a blank card in your card pool that is an attack, but if you have ways to reset its speed to print it, it's printed as technically zero. Multiple it was was a tricky mechanic to learn slash teach people right away. I remember initially having a lot of confusion about like, okay, do I have to check for these? Like, what do I like? Do I so I just move right into the next attack? Is there an enhanced step? Like, what? Like, there's just <laughs> it feels like there's so many like little things that are just baked into the rule yeah, that like, like if this multiple attack hits, does it go back to momentum? Do I get advanced momentum again? Is this yeah? Oh yeah. I don't, yep. Yep. That's another good one. There's all sorts of like little kind of kind of wonky things. And what like now that I have the rules internalized, I understand how to answer all those. But I, right away, I definitely didn't. Um, you know, it would be a good mechanic to come back, but I think would help against these railgun decks. What's that? Reversal. I would love the return of reversal. I've I've actually pushed this. We've we've I've talked about this previously. I want to see reversal back, which is which. I mean, it's just great. It's, it's I think it's fun mechanic. Um, I think it's it's an interesting mechanic. It it creates more interesting lines of play, and but I don't want to see safe back. But in particular, because so no, hang on, hang on. Hear me out. Hear me out. Hear me out. Yep, yep, safe, yep. safe was the mechanic that says if this stack has safe, your opponent can't use reversal on it. Yep. Safe is a um safe is like safe is like putting in in magic a mechanic that's like like on all sorts of cards that's like hexproof from planeswalkers just like it's a, that's a thing they've done once literally one time they put that on a card but that's like being like okay we introduced planeswalkers and now we've introduced at the same time a whole bunch of cards with hexproof from planeswalkers it's like okay like so like that mechanic <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. that that text on the card literally does nothing outside of like a specific deck that i'm playing against in the metagame or whatever that's that's fair but what i think instead they could do and and the, the problem was the problem was sorry to finish my thought the problem was that safe also if your deck just happened to have like a bunch of safe cards it not only was like like randomly good against the deck it shut down your opponent's deck entirely <laughs> it's literally like you can't reversal now and they're like oh okay well like oh, i guess Put up. <laughs> All right. My deck's made to reversal. <laughs> um, instead, this is this is a learning moment, I think. And we'll see what they do. If they do decide to do this, the learning moment is to look at what magic's doing. Magic doesn't even do hexproof very often anymore. It's a very rare mechanic to see now. Instead, they do something called ward. Ward is one of the best mechanics to join magic in a long time because it is a flexible protection ability. 
that allows yes. you to dictate how strong you want that card to be against very specific things, including things like like ward from planeswalkers. If you want to do that, you can. Um, and I I think what they need to do is just put in a new sty style of safe mechanic that just introduces an additional check cost or something if you want to try and reversal against something so imagine just putting safe safe has a number after it's safe two and if that's that'd be a pretty good one because that would mean that if you want a reversal on that you need to check an additional two to to pay for it okay and i think uh, yeah. see that now and you do that suddenly there's interaction there's play there's there's you're not shut out of the game if you're playing the reversal deck but you can safely put that just like we see with ward now wards on lots of stuff in magic because lots of stuff yeah ward one is like it's it 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 is just a is for a lot of creatures like slightly increased cost to deal with this thing okay you know like we can toss that on lots of stuff just as like yeah we have a little extra like in the budget for the creature or whatever so toss ward one on that thing and sometimes it matters sometimes it it just like slightly inconveniences your opponent but it's there it's doing stuff and and it allows there to be interaction um i especially like when they use like ward pay three life and I, they could even do stuff like that with safe like safe they the safe uh two damage or something like if you want to reversal this you take two damage to do or like it. safe discard a card yeah yep and those start to be like kind of more interesting uh, ways to to promote interaction in the game while still allowing things like re reversal to exist without just like taking over the game because like what can, you can't do anything about your opponent just like dunking on you that turn. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think again, if reversal was to ever come back, they would have to have some way to like like save or something like that. Something to make sure it's not just like hey, if they have reversal, I just can't attack anymore. Right. Yep, I'm totally, I'm totally with you on that. Um, I, it's got to be something though. I just, I think safe is just like too, too, too binary, right? It's either you know, it just, it just shuts you down, or it literally does nothing on the card. And I would like, I'd like to be like something that can be on more things without being as oppressive as like, is it ever literally, if, if literally everything had safe reversal decks are pointless to play. So you Not can't to do mention that. having safe is another keyword to make midnight better. <laughs> Oh God! Yeah, we we can't have um, that. We can't have that. Start no, getting a bunch of safe throws. <laughs> um, okay, uh, we're we're definitely we've definitely shot a little off topic here. Before we move to the close of this, I want to get back. Um, as I, but I mean, it was definitely an interesting conversation. But I want to talk a little bit more about twenty two and twenty twenty two in particular, um, because we haven't really covered the events that were run in uh in 2022 so mitch what's your take on my heroes uh they had multiple tournament seasons online events in-person events how do you feel events were um were handled in 2022 uh, so i think we'll start off with well, one of those i went to that was like my favorite event i think the 2022 nationals the in-person in texas was probably one of the smoothest run events i've seen it was 300 some 340 i think people was like around the final count but I never had any problem at all with like judge calls or any problems up no time later judges <laughs> yeah oh, yes. judges they were great um the tournament staff was wonderful the venue was fantastic they had um free water for everybody there too um, oh awesome that's really cool actually <laughs> right they said like yeah and they had it in a hotel so they had the hotel staff bring like a bunch of water jugs cups um they had four different vendors there to help out um they brought like Togo's voice actor was there. They said a lot of cool stuff to do, as well as like they had the um, gunslinger events, the the draft. Um, yeah, there's a lot of fun stuff there to do. A lot of interaction from the community. Um, the stream was great. The event ran well. The people there were fantastic. Getting to talk to like Clint again, and all the developers was a lot of fun. I think that was probably the best ran event I've been to. Of like any card game. Yeah, I think I had like any card game. Wow. In terms of like how praise. smooth it felt. That's awesome. Um, did you have any events that you feel uh, you had you had any qualms or issues with in the year? Um, I think Gen Con was probably the biggest issue in terms of like event wise. Um, my, my biggest issue, I guess, wasn't the exactly the event itself. And there are some problems that people had with like, if I go to this event, I can't go and get like, the mats at the booth and stuff yeah like that, that was but, a little 
tricky to handle yeah. but that wasn't yeah that, that's not i wouldn't give that like a, a big thing on jasco is just in terms of, like they need to have time for the events they need to have time at the booth they only have so much time to hog the open it's not the, it's not really their fault and they came out and fixed that with like hey anyone that attends these events we should do an email for product later i think i think in at origins and gen con i actually i think there's i want to take a little bit of umbrage with um with slight, like just slight little bit with uh, what Jasco is doing here. And I understand what they're doing. And I also understand there's probably some hands tied in this issue too, because they have certain obligations that they're trying to fulfill for um, the license holders and everything here. Yes, but for sure. That, yeah. I, I, um, I think they're packing too many events into these con weekends. Um, there was actually, there was a really, uh, I'll link in the description if I remember to. And if it's not there, leave a comment so I remember that I didn't link it in the description. Maybe there's a <laughs> there's a, a write-up by um, by uh, an, uh, a player in the game who's, uh, I just, I can't even remember the name of, no one I'm going to have trouble finding this, but there was a write-up by a player who attended Origins who um, had uh, actually, like, was experiencing health issues uh, following their return from Origins due to um like overworking themselves at the events basically hitting every single event every day up and and it's and the That's problem fair. was like you were saying there was a like this promo fever at the time trying to trying to get these things but like honestly like like yeah yeah the more value they pack into playing the events and then making the events one day after another every single day an event that lasts the entire day and and you are encouraged to play in these because you one need the promos two want the value uh three came down for the event to, to play in it or whatever it means that you are it's it's sort of putting the players in a position where the obvious choice is to play in everything and play as much as you can and get your money out of the weekend um and it's easy to say, well, just don't do that. But it, in, when you're put in that position, it's hard to say yeah, I shouldn't do that. It's hard because, like, again, like some people, like they went there just to play the tournament and the events. So they feel like if they're not playing tournament or events, they wasted their time, they wasted their money. It feels like a burden onto them almost. It's, it's, I, I honestly think that this is a moment where come, card game, it, this isn't just Jasco. Every card game company that's doing this at their, at these cons needs to, attempt to find ways and i don't know exactly the way to do it but attempt to find ways to create cool down time for players and this also this also includes lunch breaks like damn it lunch breaks are a required yeah, also, thing another big thing yes, we did. they announced earlier at nationals that every tournament will have a lunch break anybody yes. has a lunch break and that and that is a, a great step forward because every tournament for every card is straight up straight up you're hearing me right now every tournament for every single card game that goes a whole day has to have a break in it it has to like yeah. it's 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 actually a problem if it doesn't and then if you're doing this day after day especially if there's not lunch breaks on every event oh, also what? it's it's actually um it's putting it's putting duress on your players you don't you might not realize it you might not want to admit it but it's putting duress on your players to play in these events and can cause physical problems we're lucky that uh that this player was able to recover afterwards honestly because like imagine the problem if this player had more long-term effects yeah i'm not going to go into the potential for it but like you know it's seriously like it's it's something where um, I think when I'd love to see Jasco and other card games going to these conventions start to find ways to build in days where, you know, like there's a day in the middle where there isn't a big event. Maybe there's just like this is when they put in their like board game things or whatever, and they just try and like allow the players to like so you can go, OK, I don't care about that or I can sit down and play the board games and I'm like not taxing my brain in the same way as like playing card games for 12 hours straight will or whatever. Yeah, I can see that. I think the I, biggest thing with Gen Con is they didn't need to have three provisional events at that event. I agree. The provisionals and then an ROE. So they yeah. had what Thursday, Friday, and then a team one on Sunday. I think yeah. they could have been fine just having one provisional, one ROE, and then the rest are like, "Hey, come look at the come look at the booth, come look at this cool stuff we're doing over here." I like one products. teams because teams is fun and teams teams is not something that everybody plays in. Um, so I think one one provisional one RLE one teams is would have even been fine for me. I would have been happy with that. Um, 
that that kind of gives you a little bit of everything to do you and that that still leaves a day somewhere in the middle if you split that up like you just have like you know if you do like friday's your regional event saturday is this would be so beautiful for the players honestly if it's like thursday provisional friday regional and i know some people like don't get friday off or whatever. like i'm sorry it's gen con like just you got to come down for Friday if you want to play in the regional. <laughs> oh, yes, is, sir, yeah. if, in this plan that I have. Um, <laughs> Saturday Saturday is Top Cut and nothing else. And it's just, just and that's, and, and what that allows the players to do is like, it, it players get to take a break day in the middle. Saturday is the best day of the con to go and explore the the booths go explore that kind of stuff if you're gonna like if you're gonna have your events at a con you need to understand you're at a con and you should actually encourage people to check out the con because that's that's kind of good for the goose good for the gander situation actually for everybody yeah, exactly 100%. Um, and it gives people a day to then then jasco can say you know what our playmats are gonna we're, we have a whole bunch saved for saturday and then you go okay well i get i get to go hang out and, and play in the and and i and since i don't have to play anything saturday i'll go check out the booth on on saturday instead take a break play a board game go back watch top cut being played if you want to you know like but the key is like right in the middle there you have a break you have a break moment to decide what you want to do with the day rather than feeling duress to do certain things throughout the day um through for the entire day specifically and then sunday you can have like your fun like teams event or whatever where it's just like you know if you don't play and it's not a big deal if you do you know like then you had a break and you're fine. You know, that's the kind of structure I think we need to see. And that was, in my opinion, one of the problems in, in their events that they're running, especially at conventions in 2022. But it, I'm glad it sounds like they're at least starting to work in lunch breaks as a mandatory yeah. thing. Which they is said good. before, like, yeah, they said at that Nationals that lunch breaks will be in every event. So we had one, we had a lunch break at Nationals. We had one for the online. And yep. I'm sure they'll have ones going forward. I, and I think that's, that's, uh, the, that's the very biggest smart. issue, I guess was nailing down the, the time frame. Because like I said, at first at Nationals, they had like, all right, lunch is half an hour. Start this time and this time. Well, they said once the round ends, half an hour. The problem is there's the 10 minutes of overtime people play. So like if you're playing a control deck or you're playing Mineta and you're going all the way up to the end of the round and then in the overtime time, you might have like 15 minutes to get food to get back in time for the event. Yeah. But then they raise it like an hour for the break. But. Maybe that's the balancing factor on Mineta, is you don't get a lunch break. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> huh, huh, okay, okay. That'll discourage people from playing him now. <laughs> no, I think my biggest problem with the Gen Con event was probably the judging for the event in general. I think, again, the problem with the card game is it got too big, too fast. They took a big influx of judges. I think... At the time, the qualification to become a judge was to take a quick online exam. I'm not sure what they've changed for that yet. But it definitely led a lot of people into the judging program that didn't quite understand the rules of the card game, which led to a lot of... I know it's a common problem with a lot of people that win Gen Con. There's a lot of bad judge calls. Mm -hmm. Whether it was in the player's favor that called it or not, there were just bad ones all around. Examples of like cards not working the way they should be, um, um, cards adding a powerful range instead of giving powerful two with like uh, nitro mm, addition. Yep, yep. That is not how that works. <laughs> no, because like it's supposed to add power two, not add on two more powerful. And that led to some guy having like a powerful five attack. He threw for like forty five damage. Cool. <laughs> That's yeah, a fun interaction. Yeah. That um, is... We had some yeah, players just... too that are just uh, playing copy harden in uh, in their earth decks. So yeah, I mean, cards great was every deck. <laughs> uh, yeah but i think at, at nationals i had not a problem with judge calls i think they from the feedback from jet they got they realized it was a problem so they went through i'm not sure yes i don't know what they did with it but not a single problem with judges there not Beautiful. one they all that's good to hear had good answers um they knew under, they understood the rules of the game they understood the weird interactions that we had sometimes and they were uh, they were they were just very well mannered too just they're good people that's awesome yeah i mean like i definitely know I, I know some of the judge staff i've interacted with are definitely cool people it just it just seems like yeah i agree it was like like just trying to get started too quickly not having the infrastructure in place um to needing too many judges and only having like a small handful who were like 
universes ufs players who like really understood things or like just could those those players couldn't make events so that they just kind of grabbed whoever and like um no shade towards any of the judges at gen con or anything in particular just like yeah the fact was there were a number of kind of like messed up judge calls and as long as everybody learns from the experience it's like it's you know again like jasco this is another example like jasco is is always trying to respond to these issues um I think I think just highlighting again, 2022, a year of growing pains um, for My Hero yes. Academia, not without pains, but also not without growing. Right. The two are going hand in hand there. Yeah. Um, so uh, do you have any do you have any other like um, props or slops to throw out for 2022 here? Uh, um, so I would say probably. I would say one of the biggest slops of the year is international play. Yeah. Um, I think, so I'd like to get into the stream stuff. Yeah, we're skipping I that. Think, yeah, I think the fact that they streamed nationals, they streamed the online nationals, but they chose not to have stream for the Oceanic or the Europe it was just a bad call on their part. They should have had, should have one. Just, it would have just made sense. I've talked about this a little bit with some other people internally. Um, I think Kevin and I were talking about this for a little bit for a while, but, um, you know, it's my, my understanding that, uh, you know, there, Jasco obviously didn't fly out there to, to run yeah. anything and, well, I mean, or it was like, also online, so. Oh yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's right. It was all online, but like Jasco, um, did just got like a tournament organizers from the area to run it. Right. Because like, that's, that's what makes sense to do you don't yes. you, you'd like to have your <laughs> oceanic tournament organizer running your oceanic event you're on the right time frame yeah. you can have the prizes shipped to one person who can then ship them at a reasonable rate so you're not like you know like there's all these reasons why you do that whether or not it's a webcam or not you know um well, yeah for sure you're with that but i think it sounds like what maybe needed to happen was a firm sort of like contract plan in place where like they go okay so you get to run this congratulations here are the requirements for streaming it, <laughs> you know, like, so yeah, that yeah, for sure. Like, yeah, I think so the biggest thing is like, in terms of like just the player base, like, let's say you're in Europe and stuff and you see like, oh, cool. There's this awesome American national stream. There's this cool online national stream. But for my nationals, there isn't a stream. It As a player who's already had to deal with all these shipping problems, we need a national in terms of like not getting any promos at all until the store provisional, not getting set two for a while or set three for a while. It's just... It just feels feels bad. That's all. It's it a second bad. class citizen feeling. Yeah, you know, and you don't. I'm. I think they're gonna do better with it. I just think it's just rough to get that constantly as a national player. Yeah, I think global going global with card games is um, is a, a, a quite an endeavor to undertake. It, it's costly. It really is. It is a it's huge, troublesome. Yeah, huge endeavor in terms of like. Just shipping, handling products, getting it out in a uh, time frame. So it's not like I, it's not like I, I guess I, I, I do blame Jasco. Like straight up, it's like, you know, it, it's there, right? It's like that was, that was, ball yeah. was in their court is what, all I can say about that. However, at the same time, like I understand the issues um, that go into setting it up internationally. Like, I guess I appreciate that there are issues associated yes. with it. Agreed. Yeah. So my my hope is that that means that going forward there will be a way of uh, you know some more some more effort being put into addressing that like we always tend to see from them we do always tend to see that coming forward it's yeah, like again, after, I, I can't like, think of almost, a, almost every yeah slot I can't think, talk about in this game there's always yeah. been like they had the pop and then they recovered they learned they grew and that's all I want from a company running a game is to like listen to feedback and grow. Yeah, I, we were trying to like talking about each other, trying to say the exact same thing, which is that like every <laughs> single every single problem we've had, there has been an effort, conscious and and transparent effort um, from Jasco to ad address the issue and deal with it. So, um, do you have any? Uh, th th that was a great a great point to make, though. Like, definitely one that um, I would like to see addressed. Do you have any other props from twenty twenty two? I want to We're gonna end on a good note, obviously. Yeah. Um. So. Well, let's see which one do I want to start go with. Um, so a good prop. Um, so set four coming out. I'm sure you've, you've heard. That's a prop for 2023. <laughs> well, I mean, like it's going to come out without the six month gap. So they're fixing okay. their release schedule. 
Great. That is good. I, I certainly, I'm, I, unfortunately, I'm at an, I'll see it, I'll believe it when I see it sort of scenario right now. That's fair. That's fair. I mean, they have the, the special, at, at Worlds, they're going to have a special like preview event. Oh, that's true. No, you're right. You're right. It's pretty locked in. So, so they're probably going to have it released in February sometime. I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. It can't be six months at this point. And, and honestly, it, if it, they like, it can't be, no. I just want to see, I want to see three sets a year, four month gap. Like, I think that's all yeah. my hero really needs to do. I think that's perfect. Three sets a year, four month gap. It gives you enough time. And then they had the deal in between. So you have a little bit of shake up halfway through. So it's not, even if it, if you do have a bad set, it's not going to be stale for four months. So it'll have a little sprinkle of stuff in there halfway. I mean, I have I have my own thoughts on DLCs too, which I will share right now. Which is that <laughs> I f- I feel like um I feel like DLCs are not are are being made not to be impactful enough. Um, I don't I don't think they need to be. I don't think you want them to be like you need to pick up two of these for staples. But at the same time, they're making a product with guaranteed cards in it. Like yeah. the, if, if I just feel like as a consumer, if I'm going to buy something with guaranteed cards, I don't want to be buying something with guaranteed bad cards. You know, like I, I, <laughs> I buy random fair. packs because there's a so, chance of getting a good card or a bad card. Right. Like my and issue I'm, with the DLC is the fact that they have two every card. So you're forced to buy two of one product to get the place. Like if they're going to make it as a DLC for a consumer, charge a little bit more. And had the full place of all stuff. I would, if I, if I were in charge, if I were in charge, here's my plan for DLCs. Um, DLCs will release it, the same time frame right now. I love this, like in between a set, add a little DLC. And th- I think that's spicy. When a DLC releases, it comes with four characters. That's fine. Yep. Um, if that character is a character stacker, it comes with four copies of it straight <laughs> yes. up. You, I'm lovely. St- love it. Figure out your sheets. I don't know. Figure out how it works. I just like that's it's it's kind of weird the way it is right now. And I just think it's ridiculous. And then it doesn't just come with one attack and one foundation for every character, because I feel like all that is doing is it's creating characters who don't have enough to work or it's creating characters where the character is just like straight strong enough where you know, like there's it's like got like a good found like Kirishima, it's like Kirishima to sick character solid yeah. foundation attack doesn't matter at all like it's just like whatever like so i think the fire build i've seen runs it a little bit or it's like seeing some playing like bakugo or something but like the problem is like all the other characters in that dlc they just like they don't didn't have the pieces they need to like really make any sort of an impact in the metagame what other characters was it it was momo it was 2 momo. no 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 kirishima is momo 2 one. momo 2 uh, Denki 2 and um, Denki, Ayama yeah. 2. Denki 2 is a cute deck with some like fun interactions, but doesn't have the power to really make it like the high tier. Um, Momo 2 feels very similar. It's got a, like a, a cool gimmick, but the maybe the card pool isn't quite. The Momo 2 is a great example, actually, where like the card pool isn't quite right because Momo 2 should be like slapping breaker uh breaker onto a breaker ability a card already to like be like really breaking them up but there are no yeah, good, yeah, yeah. or weapon cards with breaker at all um like to allow momo to have two to have any like actual play so i tried playing her for a while when she came out and, and i just like as you can see by the tournament results she just doesn't she doesn't get there she she didn't have the capability to do anything strong enough to make her work and the problem is like these dlcs just need to have a honestly just need to have a few more cards in them they should just be designed like like very small sets but if i'm paying to get every single card i want every single card to be a banger and i want to have like I want to have the character. I want to take Aoyama and go, wow, I can play this. Because right now I look at it and go, this is garbage. <laughs> Just throw it behind my shoulder. I mean, trash can. That's yeah. fair. I agree. I think if they do that or don't do that, they, they should at least make it so the character's designed in a way where it can mesh with other kits. So maybe they don't have their full dedicated kit to support them, but they have enough mix-up where they can use other kits to help, like maybe half of support from this kit, half support from this kit to mesh together. So yeah, I, th- I think I think um, also, the DLCs. Quick note on Dinky Two. Dinky Two is the reason why they can never do multiple. Never. Oh, <laughs> that's, <laughs> <Nope>. that's fair. <laughs> He'd be pretty good with it. <laughs> um, I think I think for me, like the as far as like the the best release of the year was Heroes Clash, like hands down, and 
the worst releases of the year are the DLCs that came out this year. Um, I would rather see Crimson Rampage again than than the DLCs we got. There are cards from the DLCs that are good, but not yeah, enough of yeah. them. Where like it literally, I think they feel bad to buy. I like like yeah, I feel like, like the cards that were good were great, but it was less than half that were even good. Yeah, and and I think that is something that should be addressed in in 2023. I think they should. I would really like them to to not sit on their laurels on the on the DLCs and actually look go to them and look at figure out how can we make it even if they can't maybe because of how sheets work for for the cards they can't make what I'm saying happen where every every DLC has all the copies you need of the card and there's plenty of cards to like fill out the you know make the characters playable or whatever but at least at least just make it so that when I buy that DLC, I'm like, I, I open it up and go, wow, I'm so glad I bought this <laughs> because like it's, it's really tough to pay $60 for uh, one copy of Kirishima and four copies of Cannon Blast and, yeah, and four I, copies of Homage, I guess. That's, I only that's bought one set of just like two and I just straight out bought the other ones or just borrowed from my, cause I didn't want to buy, you get another $30 product to get two more foundations. I think I need. Yeah. It just like, it just doesn't, Without without the chance, like this is the problem when you're when you're sort of playing, you're toying with fire a little bit when you're toying with a, a product where it has no randomness to it, where you can't just like slap in foils and go, yeah, it's worth it if you pull the foils. Like yeah. card games, card games kind of hide the the inherent lack of value sometimes by the possibility of getting value in boxes, right? Yeah. Card games are the original gotcha games. Yes. But uh, it's like, have you ever have you ever played a gotcha game, Mitch, where you you see a pack? I don't know if this has ever been a thing you've seen, but like they sell a pack. It's twenty dollars. It comes with it comes with twelve characters, and one of them is good. You're like, who would buy that? <laughs> right? No, no. I mean, the whales buy it if that one character is good enough. But that, but then uh, if I mean, that one if, character, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then if that one character is still like it's good, but it's not as good as like the ones in the in the polls. You just they, you everyone would just call that like a noob trap pack or something. Hundred percent, yeah. And I, and unfortunately, right now, deal sales feel like sort of a new player trap to me. I, I this is a revelation I came upon as we're talking, but they feel like that to me. Where like a, a new player goes, oh cool, it must be good, and it's like, well, a couple cards are okay. <laughs> yeah, some are, some are okay in very specific decks. Yeah, but like the, I think they did a great job. Oh, another good win. Um, the eraser head and. Endeavor starter decks. Those starter the decks cards are excellent. And those were fantastic. Incredible starter decks. And, and I know they're, I, I think I saw from the release info that they're going back to doing a dual deck for set four. Yeah, um, they but are, yeah. I think they should stick with the single player decks. Um, I, I really like that method. I like that method a lot more. It's easier to get people to go, okay, like, like you can still buy them as dual decks. You buy one copy of each and then you, yeah. it's, a dual, it's a dual deck. Okay, it's like, go. great. Um, but otherwise, then if I have a player who's like, hey, you're getting into the game, you don't need to buy this dual deck. Instead, just pick up, pick up a copy of the Endeavor deck. There you go. You're in. You're in the game. You, you can play now. You got it. You didn't easy as that. Half yeah, the yeah. price. Um, so yeah, but I agree. I agree totally. The design of those, excellent. They're great starter decks. So I do. I did want to end on a high note, and then I started complaining about DLCs. So I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, do you have any other props? Um, no, I think those are the uh, okay the big ones that I had. All right. Well, um, yeah. I mean, we've gone we've gone way over our time. This is a this is an action packed episode for people. So I hope you guys got to enjoy um, like our discussion, here, my yeah, hero. Sure. I think I think. Uh, you know, the future is definitely bright for the game. Um, I, again, they keep responding to things. They keep improving. Jasco does keep improving. 2022 had its share of issues, but it also had its share of growth and improvement. And um, I and I do hope to see, um, I continue to see, oh, I have one more prop to add. The addition, okay, of, yeah. chrome, the addition of chrome rares was something that Jasco has needed to do. Um, the cr chrome rares add, the thing is, uh, <laughs> the thing about card games right now is that Card games right now in this age of social media are gaining traction based on what people like to share about them. And as great as a game's mechanics can be, it's hard to sell people on a, you can't sell people on a picture of mechanics. You just like, you can't do that. <laughs> no, no, no. You need to be producing. You need, as a card game company, every single card game knows this. Every, any single card game is being successful 
You can name ways that they're doing this. You have to be producing cards that people want to get because they look cool and want to share pictures of because they look cool and because they're rare and because they're collectible. XSRs, XRs, decent steps. All XRs should be full art. That's my take on it. Straight up, every single XR should be full art. No, full stop. Every single one. But they, you know, they at least took set three. They took steps. Every single attack is full art and some of the foundations are. That's great. Good first step. Set four, every single XR should be full art. Every single one. Every single one. No exceptions should be full art. That's my take on it. However, I, yeah, yeah, 100% agree. Like, they shouldn't have a rare and an XR rare look the exact same. Yeah, but there's some like dots or something on the phone. It's, yeah, it's hard, yeah. hard to notice. Yeah. Um, but Chrome rares were a great example of here's something that is, if, if you get this, you are going to post a picture of it to whatever social media you use. You are going to. There's like not one that isn't posted, I'm pretty sure, <laughs> somewhere. Um, and that is what needs to be done. That is how you do a marketing campaign inside your set without having to spend extra money marketing it because you're getting your players to market it for you. That is something that every card game should be doing. And props to Jasco for putting Chrome Rares into set three. I think for set four from what we've seen won't have anything like that, but keep doing it in more sets, more stuff like that, please. Yeah, I, I love that. But with that talk of that, I do have one quick little slop that okay. Jasko did. Go for it. Um, I, from what I've heard, I don't think it's entirely Jasko's fault but releasing a first edition and a limited at the same time. To the I'm really glad story. you brought that up. Yep. That's, <laughs> that was that a was... huge slop. In yes. In terms of like, because again, like you said, the Chrome Air, they're wonderful. They're awesome. They're chaseable. They're shiny. They look gorgeous. But let's say you go to a store. You're like, I want to buy a box of this brand new set that came out because I want to try to get the Chrome Air. You didn't notice that it's not a first edition set. You have a 0% chance of getting it. And if you don't notice it's not first edition when you first buy it, you open it up, you're like, oh, oh my God. Oh, it feels like garbage. I can, I can personally attest that it's not a fun feeling yeah. Um, because yeah, like our, our stores in our area did not get first edition. One of them was uh, one of our stores that I'm aware of. It was due to a mistake in shipping from the distributor, a mistake that happened because the distributor had both sets of boxes and they misshipped the the i mean it's it's asking for errors it's creating situations where errors will occur and the person who the the entity who takes the the hit from it is the player in that case and that is that is an unfortunate problem our other store i think just didn't know what was going on uh, and just like got, <laughs> and just got unlimited in it's like yep so uh but again it's it's creating confusion it's creating issues it if if you are buying if there's a first edition product of a set and you're buying it pre-ordering it and or buying it day one it should be first edition product that you're getting 100% not there's, not even an argument here no there, there's not even it shouldn't even I don't even want I don't even want well there's unlimited but it comes with a special box topper on day one nope no no I, no, no no my day one product should be first edition period then unlimited should come out later put a box topper they're doing those box toppers things now or there's like they're shipping with them or whatever unlimited with this cool promos great good yeah, do that that's cool awesome that's great not day one later because now now I have a problem with that because I got unlimited. I just I just sucked it up. I was like, whatever. Like, okay, I was Chrome I wasn't gonna open anyway. Like it was, it was very unlikely. So who cares? So I got unlimited. I opened the unlimited. And now they said, and now if you buy unlimited, you get this box topper. Well, I already bought unlimited. <laughs> Where's mine? <laughs> like it's so unfortunately I got hit twice by that. Like yeah. I, the one side I didn't get the Chrome Air, and then second I didn't get the box topper. I so it's like uh, ah, it just feels so bad. Yeah. Um, so I, yes, uh, I'm, I, I, I wanted to end on a high note, but thank you that it was another slop. I haven't heard if Jasco is going to be addressing that yet. I hope they, they do. They did address it. Yes. So what they oh, said okay. is like, if you have bought an unlimited already, they're mailing these promos to the stores. And I said, if you have bought one with the store, you would have to talk to the store about it. So it's not a great solution, but they did address it. So it's the store's problem now. <laughs> yep. Start on yeah. Okay. Um, that, so, um, so the stores great. have been great about it. Like I know um Unfun Games store and Rochester, they reached out and said, Hey, if you bought product from us, let us know. We'll get this taken care of for you. But again, awesome. not every store is gonna realize it's a problem. Right. Because some stores didn't look into it enough. 
Yep. But I, if I know Jasco, they're, they're going to be continuing to work on that, continuing to address it, continuing to improve. It's always the case of it's, it, it is once, I, I think it's actually one step back and two steps forward for them constantly. Yeah. 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 So, but, but there are a lot of steps back <laughs> and, and then more steps forward, but, but still plenty of steps back. One more slop. Oh, okay. all right. Go for it. We're here. Uh, you know it's that cool board game you played at Gen Con, right? Yeah. Yeah, you know if you buy it now, you get a promo card with it. What? <laughs> yeah, uh, there's a promo uh, Midoriya two that comes with it, and he's wearing like a a Japanese. Mm. What, what's the alpha called? Uh, it looks like a a, um, a kimono or a yeah, like a kimono. Yeah, yeah. Or y- yukata, one of the two. Yukata, yukata, yeah, yeah. Yukata, yeah. It's a it's a full art. It's a, it's a gorgeous looking card. It looks lovely. It's a full art Deku two with like the cherry blossom coming off and Deku's in a Yukata. Well, I, at least in this case, my copy of the board game came with seven copies of let's fight bad guys. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure. So like, <laughs> I'm, I'm not bad. worried about it <laughs> but. personally, but yeah, like again, these, these things, I, and actually, if I remember there was some, like the board game situation involved, I think target and stuff, maybe, maybe that's, maybe that's hearsay. I hope people don't, don't take that for, take that with a grain of salt. But I thought the board game situation also involved like target or something. And, and there was like a, there were timelines and deadlines and contracts and all sorts of things. And I think that's maybe Jasko is just, again, Jasko has their hands tied a lot of stuff, especially with this kind of like IP. Exactly. Uh, person who owns amateur IP is very heavy handed in what they can and cannot do. And I, I, and I think they've gotten themselves in, in a number of little hands tied situations that all like probably a lot of them stemmed from problems due to covid and shipping and everything like maybe maybe there's an alternate universe where there was no covid there were no shipping issues and um and the board game released with the yukata promo and unlimited came out with the promos later or something maybe i don't i don't know if the unlimited thing is affected at all but like but you know like i think i think I do give them a little bit of leeway because I, again, as a smaller company, they're more affected by these things. And it's very hard. It is very hard for us as outsiders to really know what the cascading domino effect was of all of that stuff and, and, and what the contracts say and what they have to do and what they don't have to do and what was their choice and what wasn't. So the point, I think what we can always look at, I think we can always look at is what does the company what does the company do after the mistake happens? And as you said with Jasco, every single time it does seem to be them going back and figuring, okay, how do we make this right? In what in what do we have the ability to make right about this, and how can we try and adjust it? And again, um, sometimes they can't fix it because again, sometimes it's just their hands are tied. They are yep. being told from the IP owner that they have to do this this way, and they just can't change it. Yep, and and those are unfortunate situations, um, but. They do come up, uh, but I think a lot of the things they have done a good job of like dealing with, you know, dealing with making the players happy, doing what they needed to do um, in those situations. So, um, yeah, a, a year of growing pains, lots of one step back, but two steps forwards. Mitch, do you have any uh, any last thoughts on My Hero in 2022? Any more I, last slops you want to come <laughs> up with? I think that was that. I think it's it. Unless you're okay. video more, oh, but I'm good. Uh, you just comment on the video with more. If uh, if you guys out there, this. <laughs> if you guys out there have any thoughts on my here in 2022, of course we'd love to hear from you down in the comments. Or if you're listening to this on a podcast app, you can go ahead and check out our YouTube video of the uh, of this and go ahead and leave your comments there. Or send us an email or do whatever you want to do. Join the Discord. Talk to me there. We're always chatting in the Discord. Mitch is on there. I'm on there. We'll we'll have a great time if you you pop into the Discord. Link will be down in the description below. Of course, a shout out to our patrons. I think I didn't do that in the episode yesterday, unfortunately. But thank you so much for your support, Ooh. patrons. I know, I know, I was bad. I'm sorry. I'll still God, overlay as a the patron, names. I feel hurt. I'm sorry. I'll still overlay the names on the video. Your name's going to be on there. I just forgot to shout you out. I'm sorry. But um, of course, our patrons make what we're doing possible. So thank you guys so much for supporting the channel. And if you guys did enjoy listening to us or watching us today of course go ahead and do the things on youtube if you want to those are those are helpful and stuff um consider becoming a patron and supporting us if you do like this kind of content because i'm going pretty crazy in december we're putting a ton of stuff and i, I really hope you guys do a lot of um, content appreciate. A lot of cool videos 
yeah, I hope you, I hope you enjoy that kind of stuff. But uh, that's going to be it for this um, extra supersized, wow, two hour long podcast two episode. Two hours? But, oh yes. my god, that's, that went by so fast. I know, but we had a lot to talk about. And, and Mitch, I really appreciate you coming on today and sharing your thoughts because they were really, really excellent. I hope the listeners enjoyed listening to them as much as I did, because I earnestly yeah, did have a ton of fun. Thanks for inviting me on again. It was a lot of fun to be here. I'm looking forward to being here again. Yeah, we will. We will get you on again real soon, for sure. Once I'm done with this insane month. <laughs> no, no, you're, you're good. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Well, we'll get you on after that. But you guys, thanks so much for listening tonight. You guys have a wonderful night and we'll catch you on the very next episode of the Main Deck Podcast, which will be ooh, the Dragon Ball Super episode should be coming next in um, like a few days after you listen to this. So stay tuned, guys. We'll see you next time. Have a great night.